This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. How's it going, everybody? Ah, oh, poor Blue. <laughs> He's already gone to sleep. Yeah, this is one of the ones that we, uh, serial killers that we stumbled upon that, that one night on one of the uh, newspapers.com moments. are working everything hey Jen H how's it going good to see you in here and there's quietly frozen hey are there any like computer dorks out here I was I was um, <laughs> recording you know Skype I'm mean, not Skype uh, zoom records to a drive and it looked like it filled up the drive but now my computer isn't recognizing the external hard drive like a really, you know, got a lot of crap on there. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on with that. I think that's why the computer went bleep. It makes that sound. <laughs> I wish I was a computer dork. <laughs> no doy! <laughs> you, know, and the, you know the movie Dodgeball? Out of the entire movie, the part that was the funniest moment was that comment when that, that guy, that kid said no doy. It was like it just, I don't know what, what it was. Well, maybe not the only funny part. But. Hey, welcome Alifair M. I thought you were, already were a freak. Yeah, that sound from earlier today, I think that's what that was. It was using up the entire hard drive, and I wonder if at that point there's no info, you know, no way for it to, like, I don't know. Maybe if, if anybody gets really bored, they can go look it up. But, yep, tonight we're doing something other than, you know, the recent cases. So if anybody wants, uh, probably has a better shot tonight of winning... Oh, we have to make it to the mug number, the Tumblr number, uh, but hopefully we make it to the mug number. Yeah. And I do have, I think there's somebody, yeah, Nikki124 sent uh, a PayPal in after the show, so she's in there. I'll put... Uh, Al affair in there. Oogla Boogla freaks and higher get a mug chance. Yeah, external hard drive, yeah. I think I filled it up and now it's not reading it. I might try it on my new computer that I uh, laptop and see if I can plug it into it later, but we'll see. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this is one of the the random sort of a serial killer that popped up on our screen during one of the newspapers.com episodes. 
and uh, it was crazy. Hey, look at that! Quietly frozen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We did an episode on so mean today. It was pretty. Uh, yeah. What we're gonna try to do is do a, a slower reading and then stop and. I want to uh, really know that document, like what's going on, because I think the detectives, when they in, in, were talking about the 194-page document in the uh, Living Abbey case with Kagan Klein, the police interview, I think there's a lot of stuff going on. Like we could figure out where they're going and things that they might know, you know, because I've I've gone over it a couple times, but it's like. I don't know, I need to sort of stop and think as I'm doing it, you know. And it'd be cool that, you know, the way we're doing it, I think it'll work pretty good. We got to page 51, and then we're going to... The, the best part, though, is the second half, I think. Well, cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. All right, so we're going to, uh, I guess we're going to get going on the, uh, the serial killer that none of us have ever heard of. Well, maybe somebody has, but I won't believe you if you say yeah. All right, uh, Vaughn Greenwood. Okay, uh, yeah, number one, yeah, everybody's heard of him. Yeah, Vaughn Orrin Greenwood. Okay. So uh, we're going to go back in time. I think you can, like, we might even be able to map stuff out and whatnot. Uh, some, of them, some of the people don't have a name, although I think they might be referred to. I mean, they have a name, but they don't have um, like an article that pops up with them in it. But then maybe they're talked about later. So, And then apparently there was another serial killer that showed up right after him, killing the same demographic and then there's a man arrested for that but he's been exonerated so maybe there might even be still another serial killer out there so this is back in 19 hold on I think I got the wrong years on this I think no actually I don't well that's interesting I didn't realize that huh that's crazy. Let me go back one. It's pretty weird. All right. Well, let me get that one. So apparently this guy was uh, killing way before that. <laughs> I didn't really even notice that. Uh, let, me, let me switch folders here really quick. I mean, I have a date, and I thought I was kind of messed up with it, but it turns out that that was the actual date. So he started killing in 1964, but then there was like a 10-year lull, all right? And David Russell was his first victim. And I don't even know if David Russell's name shows up in the papers at first, uh, but the second victim is 1964. The first one was 11, November 13th, 1964. And I don't know if they associated these until much later. And then the second victim was November 14th, the very next day. And his name is Benjamin Hornberg. Okay, so when we go back in time 10 years prior. Uh, so here we go. Police searched Saturday for one knife wielding assailant who may have robbed and killed two elderly men during early morning hours. So I guess maybe they were just, one maybe lived, I guess. Uh, yeah, there it is, David Russell right there. Detectives said the body of Ben J. Hornberg, 67, a retired meat salesman, how does that work, was found early Saturday in the restroom at a downtown hotel where he lived for 11 years. Found dead Friday in the patio of the main Los Angeles library was David Russell, 63, who was a, a transient. Officers said the deaths were very similar, that both men's throat had been slashed, okay? So there you go, you have two in 1964, right around the same date, and then there's another article. 
Yeah, this one. Uh, the police are searching for one knife-wielding assailant who may have robbed and killed two elderly men during the early morning hours yesterday. Detectives said the body of Ben J. Hornberg, 67, a retired meat salesman, um, was found early yesterday in the restroom at a downtown hotel where he lived for 11 years, found dead in a patio of the main Los Angeles library was David Russell, 63, a transient officer said the deaths were similar, that both men's throat had been slashed. Several persons in the hotel lobby told investigators they saw a young man, about 25 years old, run from the hotel at 5.30 a.m. The police broadcast his description, adding he may be armed with a knife. Well, they didn't describe him there, so we don't know. And then we go all the way to 10 years later uh, to an individual named Charles Jackson. They don't have any pictures of any of these people in the... And Charles Jackson, uh, that was on December 1st, 1974, and there wasn't any initial articles about him. Then we go to um, December 8th, 1974. So, I mean, this guy really, you know, goes in um, spurts here. Uh, December 1st, right, that's Charles Jackson. And then December 8th is a person named Moses Yakanak. All right, so now, we're, now they're starting to, you know, pick... Be a little bit more interested here. And uh, this one says third transient. So, uh, which one is this going to be? What day is this? This was the 11th. And yeah, so it looks like this one actually might be on the day that a third body was found. But the third transient to have his throat cut in less than two weeks. So this is does this does not include the first two that we were talking about. You know what I'm saying? Oh, wait, hold on a second. I gotta go get something really quick. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just one second. I just have to take care of something really quick. Hold on one second. There we go. All right. Uh, so then uh, there was the first two that were killed in 1964. Now this is the third recently. The third transient to have his throat cut in less than two weeks was found this morning in the Skid Row area of downtown Los Angeles. The body of unidentified man was found in an alley near Fifth Street and Town Avenue. Hey, thanks. Billy Juliana for the troll fund. Yeah, and the troll helps out again. Such a thoughtful troll. Unbelievable. All right, so this one is, the body is an unidentified man. So right now we're on, you'll hear the other names here in a minute, but uh, we're, we should be on a person named Arthur Dahlstedt. They just don't have his name here yet. So let's go put a pin where, where that is. This is in... Los Angeles, near 5th and Town Avenue. All right. 5th and Town Avenue, Los Angeles. All right, so this is going to be, we'll put these pins. The other... Uh, First two didn't seem like they had specific spots, but I guess we could try to find that later. But this one will be Arthur Dahlstedt. And that is going to be number uh, five, actually. But let's just do it the order they, they have it here. So that's going to be number three. And put the date on this one is uh, 1974, 12, And I'll actually move the date to the front. Okay. 
So there's one. And then the it says right down here, the body of the unidentified man was found in an alley near 5th and Town Avenue. On December 1st, the body of Fred Lewis in his 50s was found on the patio of the main Los Angeles library at 5th and Hope. So he was found on the patio on 5th and Hope. And Hope. So 5th and Hope, Los Angeles. South 5th Street, no. It's 8th and Hope. So where is... This must be Hope right here then. And that's Hope. So where's 5th? I guess we could say... Well, I don't know if it's... Probably the same library, I would imagine. 8th, 9th. So 8th, 7th, 6th. Well, that would be 6th. Six. 6th six right there. And I believe that's fifth. Yeah, there it is. So right here, this is where uh, Fred Lewis That's interesting, the third um, on December 1st, the body of Fred Lewis in his 50s was found. That's interesting because they have him listed as Charles Jackson. I wonder if they changed that name because he was actually found a guy named Charles Jackson on the 1st. So I'm going to put, uh, <laughs> we'll put uh, Fred Lewis slash Charles, maybe he had a different name, a uh, different ID or something. Charles Jackson, right there, and this would be on 1974, 12.01, and this would be number one is what they have them at. All right, and then <clears throat> let's see what, let's see where the library is down there. Hold on, set it on a patio. Mom, I actually went inside of it. <laughs> that was weird. I mean, this is a long time ago. Who knows what it looks like now, but maybe it's like right in there. That's what I'm thinking. They sit on a patio, so I'm, I bet you it was out here. All right. Then, uh, let's see. On December 8th, the body of an Anchorage Eskimo Moses August Yakanak, 47, was discovered in an alley behind 512 South Broadway. 512 South Broadway. This is number two. And an alley behind it, so probably back here. So right back here was uh, Moses, August, Yakanak, and he was 47. Uh, let's see, let me put the age of Jackson was 50. No, it says in his 50s. No, he's, they got him at, uh, where did they got that? Hold on a second. That no, just says in his 50s. All right. So that, look at those three right there. Hell, hell, just looking at that, they're all on the same street. On Fifth Avenue. That's kind of interesting. I didn't even know that. Jackson, no. Yakinac. 
All right, there's more on that. Now it's starting to become a bigger story because there's three identical there. All of them had their throat cut too. The body of the third, but they probably didn't link them because there was 10 years in between. The body of the third derelict to have his throat cut in downtown Los Angeles in less than two weeks, possibly by a psychotic killer who was following a television script, was found Wednesday in a vacant building in the Skid Row area. Detectives said the three murders and a savage attack downtown on a fourth derelict who was in a coma from critical head injuries may have been inspired by a television crime drama which was shown November 26th. The latest victim in his 40s or 50s was discovered by an acquaintance just inside the doorway of a building which fronts on an alley at 5th Street and Town Avenue. Which fronts on an alley. So where was that? And Yakinak was the eighth. Nineteen seventy-four, twelve oh eight. So right now you have a murder on the first. the 8th and there was one okay so you got the 1st 8th and the 11th now uh, Yakinak was <laughs> it's kind of confusing there's so many of them 8 and the 11th okay so let me get these in chronological order well, actually I put this one up here this one there okay so we got 1st 8th and 11th Detectives said the three murders and savage attack downtown on a fourth derelict who was in a coma from critical and head injuries may have been inspired by a television program. The latest victim in his 40s or 50s was discovered by an acquaintance just inside the doorway of a building which fronts on the alley of 5th Street and Town Avenue. The acquaintance stumbled back to the street, waved down a passing motorcycle policeman, and led him to the body. As in the cases of the two previous murder victims, the man's throat had been slashed from ear to ear. So this isn't like some really minor league slashing. I mean, this is, you know, you're, they're, you know, all the way around, almost like uh, Jody Arias and uh, Travis Alexander. Hey, thank you up there. I missed the Kelly Dragonborn. And also to... Diana B. Northwest Girl. Hey, welcome, Northwest Girl. And there must have been another one in there. No, that's right. Uh, and thank you, D and K. Rack. Detective said the new victim appeared to have been attacked as he slept as the three other men had been. Police were attempting to identify the man through fingerprints. The victim's acquaintance said he did not know the man's name, but that he did know the man was not a drinker. A curious facet of the attacks, detectives said, is that the first one occurred on the lawn of the main library at 5th and Hope Street just four days after the showing of a police story series episode on Channel 4. In the attack, Arnold Bowie, 54, a drifter from Montana was beaten so badly about the head that he has never regained consciousness. This, is, this isn't one of the victims, though. All right, now we're moving on to the next one. In the television drama, a detective hunted down a psychotic killer who bludgeoned to death a number of Skid Row derelicts. Stan Callis, executive producer of the television show, said the murder was depicted as a derelict himself who each time he killed was symbolically killing himself as punishment for his own failure in life. On December 1st, the day after uh, Bowie was attacked on the lawn at the library, the body of Charles Jackson, 46, was found on the patio of the very same library. Just off Hope Street, his throat had been slashed. 
Detectives said Jackson, a native of Louisiana, was slain just after he had been released from jail where he had served a short sentence for drunkenness. Then last Sunday, exactly one week after Jackson was murdered, the body of an Anchorage Eskimo, Moses August Yakanak, 47, was discovered in an alley behind 512 South Broadway's throat too had been cut. Detectives said several common elements were present in all four attacks, but they declined to divulge them. They planned to attend a special screening of the murder drama at NBC Studios in Burbank to determine just how closely the killer may be following the script. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn Riley. And here we go. We're going on to the, the, another article on that same. It's the next day. So it says, the show's cleared. Okay. Hey, everybody. They cleared the show. Okay. It was a, it was a definitely a suspect in the case for a while there. But the show has been cleared and we can all go back to watching it. Police who saw a special screening of Police Story cleared the television program of suspicion of inspiring a series of hobo killings. Uh, Police Lieutenant Charles Kilgo said earlier, I mean, imagine any of these articles being a derelict uh, hobo. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't mind those that kind of wording, really. But at the same time, in today's world, yeah, you know, you'd get banned from the newspaper just by typing any of those things. Police Lieutenant Charles Kilgo said earlier there was some su substance to the theory that the November 26th episode of the series set off the attack which began four days later. Three derelicts have had their throats cut, apparently while helpless in drunken stupors, and a fourth was savagely beaten and remains in a coma. The actual murders and the television show were totally unrelated, Kilgo said Thursday after NBC held a special screening of the show for detectives assigned to the case. The only similarity was the victims, uh, Skid Row derelicts. The crimes were not, <coughs> were not similar, he said. The television story, titled Love Mabel, was founded on an actual case in Los Angeles. Police files are, uh, as are other episodes in the series, which is supervised by former detective Joseph Wambaugh, author of best-selling police novels. Anyway, so, you know, they, they cleared the television show, thank God. And then I think this one identifies that third victim. Six officers watched a return of a television show. The officers went to the uh, I don't know if it... Yeah, there it is right there. The most recent victim was identified by fingerprints Thursday as Arthur Dahlstead, 54, um, officer said. So I guess we can put uh, that age of him in there. And he was 54. And I think that last article, didn't it say how old he... I think it was like 50... Let's see, hold on. I don't remember. It said it said the age of Charles Jackson, I think, in one of them. But. All right, so that's all there was on Dahlstead. I mean, he was the one they were talking about, and then they identified him. Okay, then let's get to... There, and then all of a sudden, literally... Uh, shit, I mean, how many days later was this? On the 22nd, so we've got 1st, 8th, 11th, and now the 22nd, there's a fourth man in this series. The fourth Skid Row derelict to be slain in the past three weeks by having his throat slashed was discovered yesterday, police said. Officers said the body of a man whose throat had been cut from ear to ear, another ear to ear, all four so far, was found by another drifter near the Los Angeles Public Library. The man, who was reported to be 35 to 45 years old, apparently was killed Saturday night, police said. And this must be Sunday. No, this is Monday. So it might have been the 21st for this guy. 
The man who reported to be... Another guy at the library, though. Huh. That's weird. The man who was reported to be 35 to 45 years old apparently was killed Saturday night, police said. His identity was not released. The first victim to be found with his throat cut was Charles Jackson. Okay. So it is Charles Jackson. And he's 46. So it's not the uh, Fred Lewis name that they had in there. So get rid of that. And then he's 46. The man was reported to be 35 to 45 years old, apparently was killed by the library. The first victim to be found with his throat cut was Charles Jackson, 46, of Louis, Louisiana, whose body was discovered December 1st on the patio of the library, about 50 feet from where the latest body was found. Uh, Moses A. Yakinak, 47, an Eskimo from Anchorage, Alaska, was found dead on December 8th, and on December 11th, Arthur Dahlstedt, 54, was found in a doorway with his throat slashed. Police investigators said they know of no link between the victims other than that they were all derelicts and all were found in a downtown area. Oh, and don't forget that they were all cut from ear to ear. That's a pretty big deal, right? That's the connection. They didn't seem to realize that. But this victim's name is David Perez. And as, as you can imagine, that's probably pretty difficult to uh, find that name like in an article at the time because it's lots pretty common name I'm sure all right so that was David Perez and then his name will come out later and then uh, there was a little bit of a break here because it goes from December 21st or 22nd and the next one is January 9th And this individual's name is Casimir. So some of these were easy to find because there's only one person in the world with their name. Their name is Casimir Starwinski. What, what, what's the funny part that's going on in here? I was trying to figure that out. Oh, you mean the... Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, let's see, 1975, 0 Yeah. So, Kazimir Strawinski. What's the, uh, how's Mary Lou in here? You mean the chat, Mary Lou, or what? Confused. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Yeah, every once in a while she can get in there. Oh, yeah. oh, by the way, this is the everything. It's a little lighter than it is up on the picture there, but everything tumbler. It's got everything on it. I might try one where there's like a black background on it. And the reds come out. Oh, I did talk to Misty Gillis. Uh, it sounds like the uh, in the case in Southern Oregon, they're sending the object off to another lab to see if they can extract DNA from it. It's not a human part. And then also the um, <clears throat> Addison County doe is in the like an extraction phase right now. And then it has to be sequenced somewhere else because uh, you know, somebody went out and cut, pretty much bought up all the labs so nobody could do what they're doing. Hey, thanks, Candlee Woodward Stone. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, those are in progress right now. Who knows when that'll be, but again, when they get solved, we'll all just be like, boom! We, the freaks, did it.
So where was the fourth one? It doesn't really... I think later on I'll give us better directions here. But, uh, I know what his name was, but... And that's not a folder. It's supposed to just be... And another folder. Man, what's going on here? So I'm just going to put these pins here for now as a placeholder. Since I don't know where they are supposed to be. We'll get to later. I think they, there's an article that has them. So we've got December 1st, December 8th, December 11th, December 12th, January 9th is Kazimir Strawinski, and he's the fifth victim. And here we go. A mysterious wine killer. See, they're trying to come up with a name. A mysterious wine killer mm, has cut the throats of five Skid Row derelicts in a little more than a month. Police say that he chose his victims well, preying on a subculture of men who have already given up on life. The body of the fifth victim was found in a cheap hotel Wednesday, his throat cut from ear to ear. The killing fit the pattern because he was a derelict. He had his throat slit in the same fashion as the others, and he was found in the same general area, said police spokesman Lieutenant Dan Cook. All of the slangs are similar enough in nature to the suspect. They were committed by the same individual, he said. Since the first slang, December 1st, extra detectives have been assigned to the Central Homicide Bureau to help hunt the derelict killer, Cook said. We've checked every midnight mission, every wino. I guess it's the wino. It doesn't say a mysterious wino killer is what they try to come up with. We've checked every midnight mission, every wino, every drifter in the downtown area we could, uh, that we could find, he said. The problem is that most of them couldn't care less. They don't want to help. They live in their own world and they feel they are not beholden to anyone, he said. These derelicts are hard to trace. They don't make friends, they don't work any place, and they don't live any place. All the derelicts have been killed and a one square mile downtown area of flop houses, cheap hotels, and missions that one detective called an urban hobo jungle. The four earlier victims were all apparently asleep in doorways or alleyways, helpless in drunken stupors when the killer attacked police, he said. That when the killer attacked police, said. Uh, the body found Wednesday was identified as that of Kazimir Strawinski, 58. So now we got his age. He's 58. At one point, detectives thought the killer might have inspired, been inspired by a television show that featured a killer of helplessly drunk derelicts. After a special screening, police said that although the victims were the same, other details of the television plot were so different that the show had no connection with the current slang. All right, so that was that was when Casimir Strawinski. That was uh, January 9th. Then on January seventeenth. Another, just a week later. I'm just going to put a random pin out here again. Robert Shanahan was murdered. And here we go with Robert Shanahan. So now it's kind of like, you know, it's becoming a way bigger story at this point. Here, I gotta go find that first page. Sorry about that. I just realized it said continues. This is on, what day is this? Uh, 
January 20th, 1975. January 20th, 1975. I think I said 65. 75. And what would the name be? His name was Robert Shanahan. Two ends and a no. Shanna? Han, yeah. Ah, didn't come up with anything. Let me just pick something on here. Smith is 65 in black. Okay. That's the article. Yep. And that's exactly the same one. Continue from the first page. And there it is, right there. All right. Now, Skid Row steamed on a muggy, melancholy day, but an old man bundled himself in a heavy army coat. I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, fears. Yeah and slept in an alley off Town Avenue. He lay half sprawled over the edge of a porch in a warehouse doorway in a red wine stupor beyond dreams and nothing would awaken him. And this article is from January 20th and as we know, Robert Shanahan was the 17th, so we've already got six people at this point. Hey, thanks Linda Howe, as in Linda Molden Howe of the Cattle Mutilations and Crop Circles. Skid Row steamed on... Yeah, I'm going to do the part. He lay half sprawled over the edge of a porch in a warehouse doorway. Around the corner on 7th Street, uh, staring dazedly at the foot traffic, shuffling by a man, one-third the sleeper's age, too young to give up on tomorrow, leaned against the building and sucked on a candy stick. He had nowhere to go and nothing to do and no bright promises to drive him through the fuzzy days. At 24, he was drowning in his own failure. They live in a city within city on the southern fringe of downtown, a community of pawn shops and bars and cheap hotels and used clothing stores, a mockery of the urban dream reserved for those without jobs, without luck, without money, and without hope. Don't, uh, don't know when. Or without hope. Been down here. And now a new element of pain, as if the anguish of their emptiness were not enough, haunts Whatever tranquility the night offers society, society's embarrassments. A killer is on the loose. He, he haunts an area roughly one square mile in size that stretches from Valencia Street to Town Avenue. So we should put the, let's draw the circle here, or the square. Let's see, Valencia... Valencia Street, Valencia and Town Avenue. Ah, that's not it. Yeah, it's with that. Oh, it's T O W N E. Is that Town Avenue right there? Oh, okay. Town Avenue, Town Avenue, and let's see, is that what this one is, Valencia? This is Town right here, and then the other street was Valencia Street. Come on. Ah, didn't mean to do that. Well, thanks for the wave attempt up there. <laughs> Linda Howe. Almost worked. 
Uh, let's see. So Valencia Street is over here. Alright. This is Valencia. You know what I should do is uh, make it like purple or something. Valencia. And then... No, wait. I thought that was... And this one's town, right? Yeah. Town. And then the other ones were from 5th to 8th. So those must be these. 5th Street. And that goes this way. Hmm. So that's fifth right there, I guess. Is it like that? Fifth. And eighth is that's seventh, eighth. What was the one that I didn't do? So it was fifth, eighth, Valencia, uh, Valencian town. That should be purple. So it's probably something like, like, hmm, let's see, I think I can do this, I think this goes over here, like this, on 5th, and this goes down to 8th, like this, and then Valencia here probably, goes up higher to 5th Street up there. Probably like somewhere up there. So it's kind of a weird... <laughs> it doesn't... And I guess this one, since this is just 8th Street, could go over here. Like this. Off of Valencia, right? So. That's the square, would be something like that. But you know, and let's see if it all, let's see if that makes sense later. I'll do it again. One. Well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because the Robert Shannon's up here. So I don't really know how that would work. And 8th Street, so it doesn't really work. I'm gonna have to just get rid of it. I'll put, we'll try to figure it out later. All right, anyways, we gave that, we gave it a shot, but it said uh, it stretches from Valencia Street to Town Avenue from 8th to 5th to 8th. It didn't fit, some of those people didn't fit in there. Yeah, we'll figure it out later, that other part. But anyways, in the last seven weeks, he has slashed the throats of six men. Four of them were uh, derelicts sleeping in the open in an alley in a doorway on the city library patio in shrubbery. Uh, two others died in the rooms of their down, uh, rundown hotels. The case belongs to Central Division detectives and in their first floor office in the Parker Center, the atmosphere is electric with tension and urgency. They know the way professional soldiers know they, uh, when attack is imminent. The slasher will, re will return. We don't know where, where and we don't know when. We're waiting, said Captain A.S. Haig, a large and solemn man 
who has spent 28 years of his life trying to keep killers off the streets. Uh, they're doing more than waiting. Policemen don't, want, uh, don't talk about their plans, but there are two large task force, one of investigators, the other of scientific detectives, after the man the Skid Row people have come to call the head chopper. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Uh, we call him a man, but we're not even sure of that, Haig said, anxious to end the interview and get on with the chase. From the slash, we think he's... Uh, fairly strong, though more muscular than the average city dweller. It takes strength to cut the rope. There is a further grim possibility the killer may be the same person who murdered at least two Skid Row de derelicts a decade ago. Uh, the 1964 murders never solved were not s dissimilar. Now, oh, see, there you go. Now they're bringing up 64. The 1964 murders never solved were not dissimilar from the 6th January-December slashing, Heg will tell you. Reluctant to elaborate, uneasy with the notion of a madman periodic return he will only say we are not discounting the possibility that it might be him. Hey, thanks, Zozo. Random killings, those committed without precise pattern or motive, are always difficult to solve, and they lead to the kind of speculation that embraces every mass killer from Jack the Ripper to the Zodiac. You know, we can't discount the Zodiac Killer, Hegg said heavily. He rubbed his eyes three days before the department had to order him to go home and get some sleep. These killings seem more spontaneous than the Zodiac killings were spontaneous. Someone who... Why did you have to say it again, the word spontaneous? <laughs> uh, someone who was somewhere at a certain time and died because of it. We just don't know. He half rose from his chair, distracted by the urgency to uh, go on his job, uh, go get on with his job, spilling over with violence. Uh, will that be all? On Skid Row, there is dichotomy of fear and ignorance among the sleepers in the alleys, the drifters in, of, uh, in the night, and the drinkers in the morning. A frail old man, incredibly dirty clothes and a soiled white navy cap, a wine bottle tucked in his coat pocket, will, ha will have you off and shake his head at the very mention of the slasher. Hey, thank you, Amber Maiden and Plato. Get you in there. Oh, we got the uh, A PayPal in there by Delva Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, this is what we, we're just trying to put this one all together. It's pretty crazy, though, right? I've never heard of this one, and this guy is a freaking monster, you know? You know, it's no different than a serial killer killing prostitutes, you know, okay, sex workers, I almost said prostitutes. <laughs> it's no different than that. Thank you, Quietly Frozen. Yeah, it's absolutely no different at all. Uh, you know, it's just a very vulnerable segment of society, and, you know, it's like easy pickings. You know, uh, sex workers today make up for the lack of people who used to hitchhike. They're, they're the only people that today will still just get into a stranger's car and go off with them. Thank you, Shogun Love and Cheyenne R. The area from San Pedro Street West towards Los Angeles Street is lined with the, the kinds of places where the displaced sleep, the Southern Hotel, the Golden West, the Panama, the, the Herald, <coughs> excuse me, the Brownstone. Uh, Spearing 34 paused to look up at them and then quickly looked away. When you think of a guy like that going around killing people like us you know that all you can do is get yourself a room lock the door and go to sleep i think there, there's al wagner maybe there is a slasher what the hell what have i got to lose <laughs> these guys 
Everyone is afraid, uh, Spearing said. Everyone is aware enough to be afraid. The rescue mission where a person can sleep free or filled at night now. But still, among the residents of the Skid Row are those not even aware a killer is loose. They sleep outside. They're such easy prey, said uh, Chaplain David Pistone of the Union Rescue Mission. They're completely drunk. They don't know what's happening. They couldn't even defend themselves if they wanted to. Raymond Smith shook his head. I, I ain't seen the place so full of fear all the 29 years I've been on the street. Smith is 65 and black, he said, of the doorstep of a storefront home next to the R&T Soul Food Cafe he owns on 5th Street. The other morning, I opened the place at 3 a.m. I saw this dude lying in a doorway across the street, and I thought, sure as hell, the head chopper had got him. You know, uh, you know what I did? He can't believe it himself. I called the cops. Hell, man, I've... <laughs> I've seen drunks in doorways before, but I'm so shook up, I called the cops. I never called the cops before. He was just drunk. What the hell? <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, Smith, I mean, just the way that's worded, you know. Smith won't go out at night anymore, but his friends, even Andy, isn't afraid. A former boxer, he jabbed the air with his left and then a right and dared the slasher to attack him. Even Andy is a small, muscular man with a gravelly voice. He shouted his challenge, punching, fainting, chopping. You give me the job and I'll get that sucker. I'll get him, he said. Even Andy is fearless. He lived on the street for 30 years and he'll tell you with a blow of his boozy breath that there ain't nothing make even Andy tremble. Hey, thanks, Tina Susser. I'll stay up night and day. I'll find him. I'll go wherever he is. Even Andy couched, fist doubled up. Then he straightened, hey, man, you got a buck for a beer? <laughs> they all speculate on who the killer is and what he looks like and why he's killing. They'll tell you he's blonde and has cold eyes. They'll tell you he's dark and wears a cowboy hat. They'll tell you his dad was an alcoholic and he's getting revenge. USC psychologist uh, Chater Mason was tried, uh, let's see, has tried to compose something of a profile of the slasher. He admits it's imperfect. Mason is sure the killer is a man and that he ranges in age from 18 to 32 we're dealing with a mental case who is beyond even the bounds of criminal society. He's a loner, a man who never is, uh, could never cope. Murder is evidence that his last social defenses have failed. Uh, if the slasher is the same man who haunted Skid Row a decade ago, Mason speculated that he may have spent the last 10 years in a mental institution and has recently been freed. That isn't, a, uh, that isn't untypical of a paranoid illness, he said. A man breaks down, gathers himself together again, is freed from the hospital, then breaks down once more. Killing, Mason said, could be a drive for power by a failure, failure who could get it nowhere else. He lives um, in a world of power and has been hurt by it. He becomes prone to fantasies, to messages from God, and he kills the Skid Row people because he's killing something in himself. He needs to destroy to assert his own power, and derelicts are easiest to destroy. In his everyday behavior, easily recognizable, only the degree of the unpleasantness, Mason said, but hell, there are 100,000 people in the L.A. Basin with his characteristics. It's just that most of them don't kill. I see him, said Sheldon Allen, shielding his eyes from the hazy sun. He's driven a golden car. Allen is 24. He leaned against a building on 7th Street. His clothes were ragged and dirty. There was a toothbrush sticking from his shirt pocket. His top front teeth were missing. I can see that, he said, grinning widely. I can see he's a pretty mean guy. Alan doesn't work or live anywhere. He sleeps where he can, mostly outside. 
He had just come out of the county jail where he served time for loitering. <laughs> That's pretty ironic. You serve time for loitering, then they put you on the street so you can loiter again. Yeah. I won't sleep out anymore if I can, but I don't know if I can avoid it. He is fairly articulate, but the process of deteriorations are setting in. I'm intelligent, but I lack common sense, he'll tell you. Weaving slightly, the conversation jumps. I take tranquilizers a lot. When I drink, I get on the wild side. I'm trying to stay away from that stuff, but it, and, but is afraid of failure in the future. Alan grinned. What future? Casimir Strowinski told those who would listen he was dying of cancer. That's one of the victims. He told that to Ginny Gallagos, manager of the Pickwick Apartment Hotel on St. Grand Avenue. She was telling Strowinski he had to move out. Uh, he had to move out that the door presumably caused by his illness, the odor caused by his illness, was too much for her. He replied, I won't be around too long. That night, January 7th, the slasher cut Strowinski's throat in his room. That's pretty weird. Someone heard a cry for help, then a jump. That was all, said Mrs. Gallagher, uh, Gallios. The next morning, a maid found him dead. Ninety people normally live in the Pickwick, a faded building. Twenty, twenty have moved out since the killing. I keep the front door locked all the time now, Mrs. Gallagher said, nervously looking around. I never used to lock it before, and, uh, before the terrible thing. I checked the halls and basement about 4 a.m. Not anymore. You want to know something? People in this building won't even use the laundry room in the basement anymore. They're so scared. I used to sleep with the door of my own room open. Now I get three different kinds of locks on it, and it's always closed. Uh, she looked around, and the mostly elderly people who uh, occupy her building, my God, she said, no one, uh, what, uh, let's see, she said, no one, what are we coming to? Not sure what that means. Al Wagner and his good friend, uh, Donaco Alvarez, were sharing a bottle of Franzia Brothers California port wine in a doorway at 4th and San Pedro Street. Wagner is 58. He has a white hair and white beard and brilliant but blurry, blurry blue eyes. He's his friend uh, Alvarez. That's not him. 61 at the age, at the stage of their uh, say, camaraderie was almost inarticulate. I know why you're talking to us, Wagner said, smiling conspiratorially we're the kind of guys the slasher goes after but I ain't had my throat cut yet just good friends Alvarez mumbled looking off to the endless distance keeping each other company he said I suppose it could happen Wagner said looking at his friend but I don't care about my life hey I used to be in the army nine years I can I can handle myself he looked at the crippled right hand I got arthritis pretty bad now though he leaned down to pet the little black and white dog at his feet he's only a pup Wagner picks up extra money delivering handbills I drink sure but not out in the open he said the police don't want me to just a little drink Alvarez mumbled in agreement a little drink Wagner looked up but I ain't doing nothing different now that I did before. Maybe there's a slasher out, but what the hell, he grinned. What have I got to lose? <laughs> That's pretty good. That was a, that was a interesting, uh, I like that article. Yeah. What do you, what do you want to call in about, uh, Skippy? Oh, yeah. Well, the numbers aren't good, so... What, what, what did we block Skippy for? Was he saying something up there before? I'm just looking up there. Oh. Hold on. Well, I gotta go. 
Got to go do something here really quick. It's kind of an interesting article, though, isn't it? You know, talking to the actual people that live on Skid Row. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, good catch there, Beholder. Good catch. All right. All right, got, let me get rid of that one. Now this is uh, saying, this is on the 24th, but it said, all right, so let me look at this. What are we at here? Okay. Uh, Jeannie Galagos won't go out at night in the corridors of the Skid Row Hotel she manages. Sheldon Allen tries to keep from passing out drunk in the doorways now, and Ray Smith is still amazed at his own behavior. He called the police just because he found a body in a doorway. So that's the same. It's kind of related to that last story. Um, hell man it was just another drunk <laughs> Smith says I was so shook up I called the cops I never done it before I don't think this I mean this article is the same it's a short version of that I don't know if it keeps going let me see uh, I think it might just be the same one alright let me get to uh, so that was Shanahan and that was uh, January 20 uh, January 17th and then on January 20 fifth there's another murder okay I mean it doesn't it, never, it just doesn't seem to ever end it's the Samuel Suarez so we'll just put another random pin somewhere out here make that one yellow for now Seventh apparent slasher victim found in a hotel. Homicide detectives said the body of a man with his throat cut found Saturday in a hotel in downtown Los Angeles appeared to be the seventh victim of the Skid Row slasher. Now they got a name. That's the one that sticks. The Skid Row slasher. The slain man, identified as Samuel Suarez, about 40, was killed in the same manner as the other six victims in the wave of savage slang since uh, it started on December 1st. I mean, we're not even two months in and he's, he's on number seven, right? Detective Captain Al Haig, who heads the special slasher squad, they call it, set up by the Los Angeles Police Department to apprehend the killer, said Suarez fit the murder pattern, a derelict or uh, wino found with his throat cut in the downtown area. We have an established concrete link between these killings, but there are so many similarities, we figure they're all tied together. Right now, we're re-weighing and re-evaluating some of the evidence in, the, in all the seven slangs so we can answer some of the big questions like, like who and why. Uh, last seen alive Friday night in the hotel lobby. Uh, news that the slasher may have killed again spread quickly along Main Street. Here, let me go back. Did I miss something on that one? Oh, yeah, there's more on this page. Hold on. Yeah, who and why? And it says Suarez's body was found at 11 a.m. in his fifth floor room 
at the Barclay Hotel. So now we can actually put this guy in a... Let's put him in the right spot here. This is at... Uh, by, uh, 103 West 4th Street. Yeah, see, it's just right in the middle of all this. And this is uh, Suarez. There we go. Yep, and you guys, we are on the 27th, only 27, 28, 29, three, four more regular days until our final donation night. And I'm trying to see if we can do the record number at the end of the month. And if you guys would like to help out the channel, you know, you can do the super chats. So you get entered in for a mug. If it's $5 or more, you get entered in for a chance. And then also PayPal, you get an extra spin. For, I mean, 50% uh, more spin. So, like if you send in $20 instead of four on a super chat, you get six chances. Like your name gets in there six times, so you have better better odds. But, anyways, uh, I know this isn't the big case going on, and you can see right now we've only got 214 people watching instead of 500 because, or 600, or 700, or 800, because as soon as you cover something else. There's a large portion that go, oh, crap, I just want to keep talking about the same thing every second, even though there's nothing new, you know. So yesterday we were talking about the case just because, uh, you know, I think there was information earlier in the day or something. And we're just trying to figure out more about the guy. And then we had a call in show. But now today there's nothing. So and we could sit there and spend all day talking about it. But on this channel, we cover a wide variety of cases and we have a series called the serial killer Sunday uh, that I haven't done one for months now and I just decided to do one today based on one that we saw so if you'd like to help out the channel that'd be great if you can't that's fine you know make sure to hit the like button and there you go <laughs> you know there we go that's my 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 one pitch for the night And we'll either do the, um, yeah, maybe tonight will be the emoji tumbler or the everything mug that you can only win. There's no, you can't buy it. Suarez's body was found at 11 a.m. In, in his fifth floor room at the Barclay Hotel at 103 West 4th. The grisly discovery was made by a houseman when he entered room 528 with fresh linen. He notified hotel manager Paul Leahy who called the police. Detective uh, Lieutenant Charles Kilgo, in charge of the crime scene probe, said police found that uh, found what appeared to be bloodstains on a stairwell leading from the fifth floor, but there were, they were not certain if they could have been left there by the fleeing killer. Residents of the Skid Row Hotel told police Suarez was known in the area and had stayed at the hotel about two days before he was found dead a couple of those who, a couple of these who knew the victim, told police he was a wino. Hey, thank you, Nikki. One, two, four. I think you're actually at the top too. You got four already in there. All right. Thank you. And Anthony Galvez. Thank you. Uh, last seen alive Friday night. He was a wino. Last seen alive Friday night in the hotel lobby. See, that's kind of crazy. So this guy's actually not just out on the streets. He's somehow going into these hotels where somebody's drunk and, and able to kind of get into their room and kill them. I mean, you know, maybe these people were too drunk and didn't lock their doors or maybe he was invited up. I mean, maybe it's a little bit like the the doodler, you know. In the lobby, residents who declined to be uh, identified or have their pictures taken 
gave their reactions. I'm not going to move, an elderly woman said. When, when I go to my room, I lock the door and nobody gets in. It's frightening, a bald man said, but I'm not going to move. It sounds too much like work. In the bar adjacent to the lobby, a patron said he had checked out of the hotel and did not intend to stay there again until the killer is caught. Why move, said the bartender. The guy could be waiting around the corner. Since December 1st, seven men have died with their throats cut in a similar way, ear to ear. It doesn't say that, but that's what, that's what it is. Here is the deadly chronology. Hey, thank you, Cameron. So it says, December 1st, Charles Jackson, 46 found on the lawn of now we can probably put pins on all of these found on the lawn of the los angeles public library okay and so let's go up in the air here that was jackson all right so jackson he was found on the lawn so let's just put it on the lawn like over here something like that like right here all right And he was 46. So I have an age on that one yet. Yeah. Okay. Then December 8, Moses August Yakinak, who's 47. Um, an Anchorage Eskimo found in an alley behind 512 South Broadway. We got that one. Then Arthur Dalstead, 54. Let's see if we can get better on this one. Found in the doorway of a vacant building at 5th Street and Town Avenue. So we don't really know, but they don't, I'm sure it's not vacant anymore. Let's just put something over here, maybe. Then December 22nd, David Perez, 42. So David Perez is, yeah, he's just random at this point. We don't have we didn't have a spot for him. Forty two, but let's see where he's found. Was in shrubbery on Flower Street near the downtown library. Okay. Flower Street. Okay, and that's Flower Street. So probably that's Flower Street. Yep, up, yep, yep. And that's the library. So probably shrubbery right there. You know. I, that's what I would I actually already got that guy so hold on this is David Perez so somewhere right around in here so very near the other ones I mean that's probably where homeless people would sleep I would imagine all right and then that was that so that was David Perez He's 42. Then we have, on January 8th, Casimir Strawinski, 58, found in the third floor room of the Pickwick Apartments at, now we've got 833 South Grand Avenue. All right, right there. So this is the uh, Casimir Strawinski. And where is he? Where do I have him over here? There he is. Right there. Slide that over to here. And that, what is that, the 8th Street? That's 9th, so their little, that little square thing they gave was a law. Okay, and then we've got, uh, so that was Casimir Strawinski. And then January 15th, Robert Tex Shanahan, about 40. Now this guy was 58, do I have, did I have him? Yeah. Uh, let's see, he was about 40. An apartment at 692 Valencia Street. Now oh, so that's way over there. Okay, so that's the why they had Valencia on there. And there he is, Robert Shanahan. And we'll just put that right there. So now we've got them all plotted out. And now, you know what, that that, that makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? The, the purple square that they gave us. 
This one's just a little outside of it, but makes a lot more sense. Everything's inside of that. Does that make sense? All right. Yeah, I mean, some of the funds, LM, I mean, here's the thing, everybody. Uh, when you send in funds to the channel, it goes to supporting my channel, okay? And out of that, I take fifth, over 50% of the net revenue, you know, after I pay my taxes and everything, I send into charity. And, uh, you know, like this this year so far, we've already div uh, donated 9600 Last year, we did 42000 In the year before, 22000 so I'm hoping to do more this year, but I mean, last year was pretty crazy. So there you go. It's not, it doesn't all go to charity. Like you, you know, you send money and it goes to help keeping me able to do these shows every single night, seven days a week. You know, I don't have, I'm not, I don't work for a television station. I don't, uh, you know, none of that stuff. Yeah. So. We're out there getting stuff done. I know I got trolls out there that always, you know, they keep making accounts and whatnot, and you know, they're doing they're doing their thing that makes them happy, okay. But we actually are out there making a difference, you know, not just bullshit. Let me put a show on, you know, like tonight there was a, you know, the same damn YouTubers doing the same shit on interviewing Jose in the Summer Wells case. Can you type in a one if you're just so sick of it? I mean, is it even interesting for 10 seconds watching that shit? I mean, it is, it's embarrassing as hell that everybody still... Who gives a shit about Jose, for God's sakes? I mean, it's, it, it, it's frightening, you know? It, it's, God, it's almost, it's almost a, a disease of some sort. Uh, it was just somebody that stayed over at the at Summer's house. Yeah, it, it just wow, it's unreal. Man, let's let's watch our nineteenth live on Jose. Yeah, it's un unreal, unreal, you know. And so I'm doing something else tonight. And yes, we did co we have been covering the Naomi case because it was a case. Moving forward, I'm, I bet you tomorrow and Tuesday and stuff like that, more information will come out, and then we'll be able to talk about that too. But I'm not going to I do a show tonight when I had nothing to say on it. I don't know what that means, Lori. That's not really Lori Fisher. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I bet he does. Uh, the winner, I'm sure he's got more people, you know. There, I got, I got, I got some shit I gotta do real quick again. second. All right. Excellent. 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 So we're back to this. All right. So we were on then Shanahan was found 40 in an apartment at 692 South Valencia Street in the Shanahan Sling. Police found a heavy knife still buried in the victim's side. Wow. Leading to speculation the killer had been interrupted during the attack. January 25th, Samuel Suarez. 
Um, have we done him? Yeah, he's right there. So Samuel Suarez, about 40, was found in Barclay Hotel. Is that still around here? Oh, yeah. So that's... Wait, isn't that the same one? Wait. We already, oh, we already got that in there. Okay. So, uh, was found in the Barclay Hotel. Each now... Sla each now, each new slasher killing, Heg said, creates a flood of tips and leads that uh, have to be checked out. And some of the men on the squad have worked 36 hours uh, at a time trying to run the thing down. Much of the investigative effort has gone into trying to create a psychological, psychological profile of the slasher, Heg said, uh, something that will give us a definite picture of the killer that we can use to seek public help in finding him. One thing we know for sure, he's stronger than the average city dweller. It takes a lot of strength to cut a man's throat. Another thing the detective also uh, know is the slasher's macabre murder pattern. The bodies of all the victims have been discovered either on Wednesday or on the weekend. Yeah, I mean, that's three days in a week, but yeah, I mean. Slasher claimed seven victim. Uh, that's, uh, that's the new one. The latest victim in the series of a murder that began December 1st is Samuel Suarez. Uh, the facts are known. He is stronger than the average Skid Row resident. The mission halls and flophouse hotels are getting crowded at night in lower downtown Los Angeles. Residents of the hotel told officers Suarez had stayed in the hotel about two days before his body was found. He was described as a wino by his acquaintances. Each killing creates a flood of tips. Some of the men on the squad have worked 36 hours at a time trying to run this thing down, Heg said. The first victim was Charles Jackson, 46, found on the lawn of the public library December 8th, the body of Moses Yakinak, 47, an uh, Eskimo from Anchorage was found in an alley. Arthur Dahlstedt, 54, was found dead in the doorway of a vacant building December 11th. So they go through the same thing. All right. Uh, a little different, but not this, uh, almost exactly the same. Then we get to uh, January 29th. So that was, Samuel Suarez was January 25th. Oh, and Linda Howell on the, <laughs> hold on, Linda Molden Howe on PayPal, thank you. Alright, uh, let's get to the, so this is George Frias. So, the Skid Row slasher apparently is killed for the eighth time, and police today threw more investigators into the intensive hunt for, for him. The latest victim was found with his throat slit from ear to ear, the slasher's trademark, Wednesday night in Hollywood. It was the first time an apparent victim of the slasher has been found outside the dismal downtown Skid Row area. Yeah, so now they've got, uh, you know, different, it's in a different location. Wednesday night in Hollywood. So, police commander Peter Hagen likened the intensity of the investigation to probes which followed the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy and the killing of Charles Manson, or the killings in the Charles Manson case. The victim was identified as George Frias, 45, so now we got another one. George Frias, and he's actually works at a, now this person's actually a worker. It's not a, a Skid Row person. The catering service, um, so he works for, you know, a catering service for a hotel, the Hilton. 
So this is 1975, January 29th. And he is 45 years old. It's interesting how they're all kind of in a similar, you know, you got Hold on, I gotta go back and get some ages. There was those, that article had it all in it. Just a second. So Samuel Suarez is forty, and Shanahan was around forty, forty-ish. Didn't really have a number in there. Okay, George Frias. Yeah, you got like 40s and some 50s. Uh, the victim was identified as George Frias, 45, a secretary in the catering service of the Los Angeles Hilton Hotel, a few blocks west of the Skid Row area. Police are working on the supposition that the latest killing is linked to seven previous murders in which the victims, all single men from 40 to 58 years old, who lived alone were found with their throats cut. A bloody knife was beside one body. Most of the victims were transients in the downtown Skid Row area. The killing began December 1st. Hagen said more investigators have been borrowed from other departments to join in the effort to find the mysterious slasher. <coughs> Hagen said an undercover of officers decreased uh, I mean, dressed as derelicts, known as the Slasher Squad, are mixing with the Skid Row community. So they're dressing up as Skid Row and walking around. But so far, the tactic has produced no result. Well, probably because you go down there and you put a little coal on your face, but you're wearing like Drakkar cologne or some shit. And, you know, they can tell from a mile away that you're not a freaking bum. So, you know. Hagen said undercover officers dressed as derelicts. So did you did you include the smell with you? Did you do that? I bet they didn't. Hagen cited these similarities between the latest killing and others. Frias was apparently slain on a Wednesday. The other victim appeared to have been killed on a Wednesday or during a weekend. The victim worked in, it's just men uh, in this case. The victim worked in central Los Angeles the others were transients who lived in Central City or frequented the downtown area. There are many points of similar similarities between the murder and the previous slasher murder, Hagen said. His throat was slashed in the same manner that the other victim and had their throat slashed, and there were certain identifying clues that indicated it was the same suspect. Hagen said he was at a loss to explain why the slasher had struck in in a better neighborhood. Yeah, well, I guess we don't really have the exact spot yet. But. Now, the body of a 45-year-old catering service employee was found with his throat cut Wednesday night, and police said he may be the eighth victim of the slasher. Skid Row Slasher. The intensity of the search for the slasher was stepped up following discovery of the body of the latest victim, George Frias, on the bedroom floor of his apartment. His throat was cut and police commander Pete Hagen said the killing appears to have the same method of operation as seven earlier slangs. Hagen said the search for the slasher and had reached the intensity of the investigation into the assassination Oh well, yeah, well, we already went through that. The robbery homicide division, which is in charge of the slasher killing, has borrowed more than more investigators. Officers said there were no signs of a struggle in Frias' apartment. Uh, Frias was an employee at the downtown Los Angeles Hilton Hotel, only blocks from central Los Angeles. Officers said there were no signs of struggle in Frias' apartment and no murder weapon was found. Frias's body was found between 9.30 and 9.45 p.m. 
by the apartment manager who said he entered the apartment because Frias did not leave for work um, at his usual time earlier in the day. There are many points of similarity between this murder and the previous slasher murders. It did break a pattern though because it was, wasn't, uh, wasn't a, a homeless person. Or as they would call it, a derelict. Hmm, let's see. I'm gonna check something out. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, hobo, uh, skid row, derelict, they call them. Slasher linked to eighth killing. The mysterious stalking skid row slasher has apparently struck again, police say, moving this time from the hopeless world of the central city to middle class Hollywood. The latest victim was found Wednesday night, his throat slit ear to ear. Police Commander Peter Hagen said the investigators are working on the supposition that the killing is linked to seven previous ones. Now, I think this is pretty similar to the last one. So let me, here's an actual picture. Uh, I mean, that's pretty crazy, right? Like, Oops. <laughs> Let's see, what, what's the middle? There it is. So, the body of George Frias, 45, is removed from an apartment. Oh, we're on this one. So now we got it. There it is. 1712 North Kingsley Drive. There we go. All right, here we go. 1712 North. Kingsley Drive. Yes, it's a little, yeah, quite a bit of ways difference there. that where like Hollywood Hills was right up there or something I don't know that's yeah, quite a whiz bit of ways I mean that's uh, four and a half miles away well yeah at least they gave out the address yeah I don't even know what that means. Hmm. I see the phone number. Yeah, well, there's a lot of mentally ill people that show up to some of these uh, channels. You know, especially the, you know the ones that go out and they have nothing better to do with their lives at night than to create fake accounts and type on other people's channels and then create account after account. I mean, they are just so... And, and not only that, the basis for their own feelings is not true. They just don't realize it because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. It's unreal, okay? Uh, so they're really angry about something that isn't real. That's the 
scary part about these wackos. So yes, if you're one of those people, call that number immediately. You know, Cameron, go ahead and get that call going, all right? Yeah, so here we go. This is somebody, uh, the body of George Frias, 45, is removed from an, an apartment at 1712 North Kinsley Drive. But I noticed that the, the troll fund dried up. So even the troll, hit the funds aren't, they, they, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> well, it worked. It, you guys tried for a while, though. Those are called assholes. No, no, they're, I guess it's not the, uh, what do you call it, the impersonator. They're just regular people. Although it's, it, it is the same person. I know that. It's uh, a guy named De Winter. All right. And it's not really his real name either. I know what his real name is. All right. So let's go to this next one here. Maybe he was just goofing around because you typed that in a lot. <laughs> Beholder. Maybe we can. Maybe the the one up there you could read it differently than the way he did it. Should we give him? A, let's let's give him a shot. Let's see if he's. I'm gonna unhide him for a minute. But get ready to go. Get ready to go. Get ready to go on him. All right. Get ready to go. Could have been uh, a different meaning. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> well, I'm doing it anyway, so you keep an eye out. Keep an eye out. And also, if he doesn't say anything in 10 minutes, go up and delete it again anyway. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Forget it then. <clears throat> All right. Here we go. See, I was trying to be nice. I was trying to give it somebody a shot. Hunt for slasher intensifies after eight victim is found. All available resources of the Los Angeles Police Department were marshaled Thursday to find the Skid Row slasher before he kills again. Uh, but by the, I'm just letting you guys know that right now we are at, we're not even at 50% of a normal night. And I know we're not covering the big cases, but it gets... It does get discouraging when you're not covering, you know, the one that everybody wants to cover, and then it's like it goes. <laughs> all right, so all available resources of the Los Angeles Police Department were marshaled Thursday to find the Skid Row slasher before he kills again. In the aftermath of the eight slasher murder, the LAPD issued photograph of composite drawings of what the killer may look like. Um, and said he probably is a six foot, 190 pound, uh, they actually say a homosexual with stringy, dirty blonde hair. Well, why are they saying that? See, that's what I was wondering. Remember when I was saying, if, I mean, uh, you remember the, the doodler, you know? It was interesting because I was thinking, well, these people are being led into their rooms or homes you know, some of these apartments in there doesn't seem to be a struggle or anything like that. The composites were drawn from common elements in hundreds of police interviews conducted since the first victim was discovered December 1st on the lawn of the Los Angeles Public Library. We're putting every available resource at our command to solve this thing, the commander Peter Hagen, an LAPD spokesman. A special slasher squad was expanded into the slasher task force uh, coordinated by the Central uh, Robbery Homicide Division. Assistant Chief Daryl Gates was placed in charge. Hey, thank you, Free Bird Forever. We'll go ahead and throw that in there. Uh, Hagen said the investigation is the most uh, concentrated efforts since the Robert Kennedy. Yeah, we heard that one. The body of the eighth victim, George Frias, 45, secretary of the Los Angeles Hilton, was found Wednesday night in the bedroom of his apartment at 1712 North Kingsley Drive. His throat had been cut from ear to ear in the now familiar manner. The slasher and 
police uh, said there were other undisclosed identifying clues connecting Frias's murder with the deaths of seven others. Hey, thank you. Paint it black. You've been around a long... Oh, wait. Yeah, you've been around a long time. <laughs> 24. Used to have a different name, though. Right? Wasn't it Pink... Something? Pink is our RX or something? I don't know. I can't tell. That's the same. His throat has been cut from ear to ear um, in the now familiar manner of the slasher. So this is the eighth one. There are also similarities Frias uh, gainfully employed with regular work habits, not a dissimilarities, he said. So this is a uh, person that's gainfully employed with a regular work habits, not a down and out derelict. He lived in a 32 unit Uh, not really, Patty. Uh, story, modern apartment building with a swimmer pool, not a skid row, alley, or cheap hotel. Let's see. His $175 a month apartment was away from the downtown area where the other victims were found. The change in pattern raised police concern that the slasher might now strike anytime, anywhere. Apartment house manager Albert Moreno discovered Trias's body after a woman identified herself as a co-worker of the victim, told Moreno she had discovered that the door of Frias's apartment number 106 was open. Moreno recalled it was about 8 p.m. when he checked and found Frias on the floor of a bedroom. Frias had failed to go to work Wednesday, and for him that was highly unusual. Acquaintances described him as a hard-working Conscientious employee. Uh, he was one of the hardest working people in the sales department. Dedicated. Extremely conscientious. A fellow worker said he was a lone wolf. Really a loner. He ate alone. He was all business. Frias was very carefully uh, uh, was very careful about his appearance. Dressing fashionably and wearing flashy shoes. He regularly caught the bus to work at about 6.30 a.m and others stayed over overtime. He was a very uh, good tenant, Moreno said. He used to have men over for dinner in his apartment, but there never was any dis, uh, disturbance. The apartment house manager said he saw law, uh, that uh, last saw Frias alive on Tuesday when he asked Moreno to add the name of Frias, his new roommate, below his on the mailbox. Police checked the whereabouts of the roommate and discovered he had checked into Norwalk State Hospital before Frias' death and was still there. His identity was not disclosed. Let's see. At, was not disclosed. Was this supposed to cut over here? I don't, I don't understand why it just goes right over the word at. Hmm. That's kind of weird. Maybe it was supposed to go from, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Because right down here it ends with a period, right? And then up here it starts with a lowercase at. Los Angeles colleagues that he said, since that, that was never solved, he said he, in a telephone interview, I've always wondered what a jail or nut house the guy was because someone who kills like that doesn't just stop. Those are the ones from a long time ago, I guess. Hmm. That's bizarre. I don't know why it just skipped like that. There's nothing else. Maybe there was more down below. I don't know. But anyways, I'm going to move off of that one. And then we're going to go to Clyde Hayes. So now on January 31st, there's another one. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Clyde. And it's not actually as Hay, not Hayes like they had. Clyde. Wait. This is 1975. one. 
And here we go. Skid Row Slasher claims ninth victim. Uh, police mounted an intensive manhunt today for Skid Row Slasher, described as an um, animal who preys on weaklings and crippling and cripples. After a ninth victim was found with his throat slit, Clyde C. Hay, 34, an employee of the National or National Cash Register Company, was killed late Thursday or early Friday in an old apartment house in a modest Hollywood neighborhood. Police said a co-worker who became concerned after the man failed to report for work, found the body. Uh, um, Hayes' neck was cut from ear to ear in the familiar pattern of the slasher. The coroner's office said there was also evidence the slasher had beaten the man into submission before killing him. I wonder if there's anybody out there that was like, man, I, I'm going to, you know, they, they pretended to be, you know, just copied to make it look like it was and I don't think I don't think so but I mean I'm just saying you, you could imagine somebody just going ooh because they read about what happened to him in the paper there's no question it was the slasher said assistant police chief Daryl Gates he declined to elaborate so they know for sure he described as a large man I think there's some other stuff going on that we don't know it about so Hay was described as a large man was found partially clad in his living room of the $130 a month apartment. A police spokesman said the door was unlocked. He said there was no sign of a struggle, so he let this person in. A woman who lived next door said he, she heard a thumping sound at about midnight Thursday. It sounded as if someone was jumping, but I didn't pay any attention because it stopped. Hay lived about six blocks from the apartment of the slasher's eighth victim. George Frias, a 45-year-old secretary at the Los Angeles Hilton, killed last Wednesday. The other slasher victims were winos and derelicts who lived on Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles, about six miles from the Hollywood area. But police said the shoes of several victims were removed and that there were other identifying clues. That's, I, that might be... Like a signature, I guess, of the scene of the slasher killing. A psychological profile of the slasher compiled for police depicted him as a sexually impotent coward, an animal who hides in the dark and preys on weaklings and cripples. Shortly after Hayes' body was found, police detained a man who fit the description of a composite drawing of the slasher. He was later released. He was one of 12 men questioned and released Friday. Hey, thank you very much, Sandra Turner. All right, we're about 70% now. Thank you. Yeah, that's 70% for the Freak Heart mug. Yeah, they just seem like they let him in, so... Police uh, Commander Peter Hagen said the investigation was the most concentrated since the 1968. Yeah, we've already you've already said that in like nine articles. Shortly after Hayes' body was found, police detained a man who fit the description of a composite drawing of the slasher. He was later released. He was one of 12 men questioned and released on Friday. So the other slasher victims are Charles Jackson, 46. December 1st. Moses August Yankinak, 47, December 8th. Arthur Dahlstedt, 54, December 11th. David Perez, 42, December 22nd. Casimir Strawinski, 58, January 8th. Robert Tex Shanigan, January 15th. And Samuel Suarez, age unknown, January 25th. And here's an image of that murder. Uh, apparently, the ninth victim of the Skid Row slasher, the body of Clyde C. Hay, 34, is carried from a Hollywood apartment house. The body of Hay, H-A-Y, there's no S at the end, an employee of the National Cash Register Company was discovered last night in an apartment about one mile from where the slasher's eighth victim was found Wednesday. The two apparently were killed within hours of each other. Interesting. So they found him like a day later. Yeah. It's 
crazy. I don't know exactly where, where, where do I have him? All right, so it's about a mile from Frius over here. Uh, so we'll just kind of put it over here for now, somewhere. I definitely changed up his MO. That's kind of, see, that's unusual, like right there. You know, he completely changed that up in terms of the victimology part of his MO. It sounds like the killing portion of it was the same. But he was killing Skid Row and, uh, you know, derelicts living on the streets. And then he switched over to actual professional people. But he killed them similarly. All right, so the Skid Row slasher apparently killed his eighth and ninth victim within hours of each other, carrying his mysterious terror from the alleys of the central city to middle-class Hollywood apartment houses. The police revealed that one of the marks of the allegedly homosexual killer is that he removes the shoes of his victims. That's, so that's a, definitely a signature. The body of Clyde C. Hayes, Hay, 34, an employee of the National Cash Register Company, was found Friday in his $130 a month bachelor apartment in East Hollywood. His throat was cut from ear to ear in the by now gruesomely familiar way, and police say there is no question he was killed by the slasher. Although Hay was the ninth victim found since the slaying began on Skid Row, December 1st, detective said he appeared to have been killed Tuesday night or early Wednesday, only hours before the slasher cut the throat of another man, George Frias, 45, in an apartment house a half mile away. All the previous slasher slayings took place on a Wednesday or during the weekend. Detectives said the slasher leaves a number of distinctive clues. So that might be a signature too, the Wednesday and the weekend. The shoes of the first victim had been removed and pointed at the dead man's feet. The shoes of the first victim had been removed and pointed at the dead man's feet. Investigators said, and subsequent victims have had their shoes removed. One of the greatest manhunts in the city's history searched for the prime suspect, described as six feet tall, a 190-pound man in his 20s with a prominent nose and stringy collar-length hair of a dirty blonde color. Police said the slasher is believed to be a homosexual who kills out of sexual frustration. A composite picture of the man was developed from the hundreds of interviews, police said. Six men matching the description were arrested Friday, including, the, uh, including one sighted in a restaurant a few blocks from Hay, uh, Hay's apartment house. All were released after questioning. Police warned that the killer breaking out of the original pattern that earned him the Skid Row slasher nickname can strike anywhere at any time. Right, so now you gotta get rid of that moniker, right? His first four victims were derelicts killed as they lay drunk in alleys and doorways in Los Angeles Skid Row area. The fifth was another derelict, but was killed in his room at a cheap hotel. It's almost like he's slightly moving up on each one, you know. Four derelicts on the street, and then the next ones are in apartments, and then the next ones are in, they're, they're not even derelicts anymore, there is like it's almost like um, he thinks of himself as more worthy now or something like he's killing, you know, slowly increasing the status of the life of the victims. Right. That's sort of that's interesting. Um, so let's see. His first four victims were derelicts killed as they lay drunk in alleys and doorways in Los Angeles, Skid Row area. The fifth was another derelict but was killed in his room at a cheap hotel. The next was a quiet living truck driver, not a derelict, who lived in a modest apartment not far from the scene of the previous slayings, followed by another killing in a cheap hotel, right? So it's like now they're not on the streets anymore, they're in a hotel, but they're still, you know, not uh, a little down on their luck, I guess. Almost all the victims were small, weak, 
middle-aged, crippled, seriously ill, drunk, or otherwise helpless. Jeez, he probably just sat around watching for people that just looked like they were struggling. Freaking barbarian. Skid Row Slasher slays ninth victim. That's how it's the same line. Uh, his neck was cut from ear to ear in familiar pattern. There is no question it was a slasher. A woman who lived next door said she heard a thumping. Yep. The other slasher victims were winos and derelicts who lived in Skid Row. A psychological profile the slasher compiled for police depicted him as a sexual impotent coward. An animal, uh, similar to the, uh, you know, the, the guys that come in and, uh, let's see. Well, never mind. <laughs> Thanks, Blind Squirrel. <laughs> Yeah, you, blind squirrel. You know, even you can go catch a nut someday. <clears throat> or is it find a nut? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's all the same. <clears throat> yeah. Now, shortly after Hayes' body was found, police detained a man who fit the description of a composite drawing of the slasher. He was later released. He was one of 12 men questioned and released Friday. Police commander Peter Hagen said the investigation was the most concentrated since the 1968 assassin. God, how many times are they going to say that, man? Although these are all within like four days of each other. So, And then this one, uh, two big uh, puzzles for police in slasher hunt. So let's see what this says. Uh, the hunt for an elusive killer who has slain nine men in Los Angeles and Hollywood in the past two months continued Sunday as police puzzled over two facts. Only one of the victims of the Skid Row slasher had been drinking before he was killed, raising the question of how the slayer got close enough to his victims to cut their throats. Victim number nine, Clyde C. Hay, 34, who was found on the floor of his Hollywood apartment Friday, didn't show up for work Wednesday or Thursday, but an autopsy showed he was killed late, uh, wasn't killed until late Thursday or early Friday. Wow, so let's see. He didn't show up for work Wednesday or Thursday, but in the autopsy it showed he was killed Thursday night. Weird, so he missed work Wednesday. Was he being held against his will or? Uh, hey, or maybe he stayed alive, barely alive somehow, I don't know. Hayes, fellow worker of the National Cash Register Company where he was employed as a mechanic considered him hardworking and conscientious, leading police to wonder where he was the last two days of his life, right? He was described as a very quiet man of regular habits, and the only sound from him, his flat, which was heard by a neighbor during the last hour, was a thumping sound. An autopsy revealed Hay, like many of the other victims, had been beaten on the head. Uh, word that eight of the nine victims hadn't been drinking before they died came from the coroner deputy Sunday. Well, that's kind of weird, too. So they're not really, you know, winos. I mean, you know, I mean, I guess they're not wasted or anything. The only exception, they said, was the second victim, Moses Yakinak, 47, an Eskimo whose body was found in a downtown alley December 8th. Yakinak's blood alcohol level was 0.23. I mean, that's really, you know, unless you're an alcoholic, I mean, that's a level that if you're just somebody that went out and had it, you don't drink very often and had 0.23, you probably wouldn't be awake. As coroner deputy Ralph Bailey said, might mean the victim had a glow on, but he wouldn't be passing out. Well, <laughs> come on, that's pretty. 0.08 is legal. 0.23 is way up there. Yeah. I don't agree with that. He wouldn't be, you could definitely pass out on that. Unlike Yakinac and six other derelicts who were, unless you're an alcoholic and your body's used to that amount. Uh, unlike Yakinac and six other derelicts who were found in downtown alley doorways or flop houses, the two latest victims were employed and lived in uh, comfortable Hollywood apartments. The body of George Frias, a 45-year-old secretary of Los Angeles Hilton, was found Wednesday in his $175 a month apartment at 1712 North Kingsley Drive. Because of Frias and Hayes' death, police moved part of their search force from the wino jungles of downtown Los Angeles to the palm-lined residential streets of Hollywood during the weekend. 
Police Commander Pete Hagen said the manhunt, one of the largest in city's history, is going around the clock, and members of the police slasher squad are working without days off. A special telephone number has been set aside for the tips. Hey, Chloe. <laughs> I'm going to have to flip over there now. <laughs> and a right, and a right, and a right, and a right, and a left, and a left, and a left, and blue. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Look at Chloe. Isn't she just a, a hell demon? <laughs> Blue's like, can you let me just sit here for God's sakes? Oh, man, she's just... <laughs> Doesn't she just... You know what? Uh, Chloe is the dog version of Mary Lou, okay? There's just no doubt about it at all. You know, just bugging the hell out of everybody. And Blue just wants to shut the hell up and be John Boy up in the... And there she is. Every single... Ugh, man. <clears throat> all right, so I'll see. The body of George Frias... Oh, we already did that. Because of Frias and Hayes' death, police moved their squads, right? Uh, police Commander Pete Hagen and the man, one of the largest in the city's history, is going around the clock. A special telephone number has been set aside for tips from the public, and more than 500 calls have been screened by detectives. But in spite of their efforts, police say, they have little substantial information to work with. Hagen shot down one flight of speculation Sunday when he told reporters a convicted mass murderer who escaped from a... Uh, Tehachapi prison in November was not the prime suspect. Carl A. Edder, who was convicted 15 years ago of killing a family of five, is not a prime suspect, Hagen said, even though four of the family members' throats were cut. Um, Edder was uh, ruled out as a prime suspect because his slath, uh, slashing method in the earlier killings was different. Yeah, they, they kind of had a few articles on that, but I didn't, I didn't go over those. All right, then it uh, turns out on February 9th, 1975, like a month later, a woman dropping off books at the Los Angeles Public Library on December 1st discovered the body, this is the first one, of Fred Lewis, 50-year-old transient, but it wasn't Fred Lewis, you know. That guy's name is Charles Jackson. Now, within four weeks, six other Skid Row derelicts had been killed in the same grisly manner by what police referred to as the slasher. Everyone likes to think they're playing it cool, that they're not scared, said Eugene Gideon at the Union Rescue Mission, the area's hub. Uh, you can bet your bottom dollar they're concerned everybody's a little uptight. The terrible thing is that we don't know what he looks like. We've got 500 to 600 dudes that come in here every day. It could be anybody. Police, meanwhile, were... Tr <laughs> Man, yeah, Blue just got pissed off. Police, meanwhile, were treating it, uh, treating it that way. The chief police spokesman in the case, Commander Peter Hagen, said that the investigation was the most concentrated effort since the assassination of Robert Kennedy and the mass murders of the Charles Manson family. But the police had not come up with much. They described the man as unusually strong, who finds small victims, overpowers them, then cuts their throats with a lateral slash to the spine. Uh, often, the attacker removes the shoes of the victims. The killer then said was probably a six foot, 190 pound, homosexual with long, dirty blonde hair. He picks his victims, picks his own time and location, and he controls the situation, and that's cold blood, said Deputy Police Chief George N. Beck. He strongly identifies with the derelicts and drifters he kills, and we think he's trying to resolve his own inner conflict by turning his wrath and hatred outward 
against those with whom he identified. Hey, thanks, Pebs W. And thank thank you to all the uh, you know the the consistent freaks. You know the ones that are here every single night watching. I really appreciate you guys. I mean, it's amazing. You know, uh, and I, some can't be here every single night, but you're here most of the time. So I really appreciate that. It gets a little disheartening with the ones that are just like, oh yeah, yeah, I gotta keep watching. You know, they're probably lost about 50 of them to watching stupid ass Jose for the 1800th time. You know, it's like, who gives a crap? Honest to God, you know. Uh, let's see. But that theory did not look good. So let me see. Said right up here. Uh, let's get to this part. He's trying to resolve his own inner conflict by turning his wrath and hatred outward against those whom he identifies with. But that theory did not look too good last weekend after the slasher had struck for the eighth and ninth time. Dead were George Frias, 45, a secretary at the Los Angeles Hilton Hotel, and Clyde C. Hay, 34, an employee of the National Cash Register Company. Both were residents of middle-class Hollywood apartments. Hey, but hey, I, I know, Pebs, I got it. I, I'm really busy right now, but we'll, we'll figure out something. And if you don't hear back from me, send me another one at some point. All right. Now, uh, let's see. He's not even... He's not even credible in some... Yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. It's just stupid. Um, Hollywood's apartment. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so those two do kind of throw things off a little bit. Like, you know, he's having an inner turmoil. But see, I think what he was doing was, it's almost like um, he was somebody, this is what it seems like. Doesn't it seem like he thought he was evolving himself after killing people in different socioeconomical status? Like he kills this level. Oh, okay, these skid row bombs, I'm going to kill them. All right, now I'm going to kill some ones that are sort of down on the map, but they got a ho apartments and everything. Now I'm going to kill regular workers. And, uh, yep, I got it. Yeah, you, you, she sent me the um, number to, you know, I get, we got to get her mom on to tell her domestic violence story. So we'll, we'll get that done. It'll, I, may, I might just make it a standalone, you know, add it to that list. All right. There we go. There's one. Then on March 16th, boom, look at this. So this is March 16th in Los Angeles. And no, the, you know, the guy isn't a white guy with, you know, <laughs> with a big nose and all this shit that they were talking about. Investigation into the ninth ritualistic slasher slang in Los Angeles is being focused on the burglary assault suspect police have been holding for almost six weeks. Both police and prosecution sources say they are taking a hard look at Vaughn Greenwood, 31. Let's see where he lived during this time. He lived at 1706. West Jefferson Boulevard. And that's right over here. So outside. We should have taken a guess first, but I didn't do it. Vaughn Greenwood. And you go down to the ground here. Right there. Isn't that wild? I'm sure that house has been there. That looks old. Yeah. Yeah, so he's down here, up here, up here. That's his safe zone over here. Uh, both police and prosecution sources say they're taking a hard look at Vaughn Greenwood, 31, of 1706 West Jefferson Boulevard, arrested February 3rd in connection with a savage knife and hatchet attack on two men in the Hollywood Hills. 
Despite the intense interest in Greenwood, a source close to the slasher probe uh, said uh, not enough evidence has been gathered to file a murder complaint against anybody. No evidence involving Greenwood has been presented to the Los Angeles County Grand Jury. I have absolutely no comment on the matter at this point. Uh, Deputy District Attorney Marshall Goldstein, the prosecutor Bush was assigned to the mass murder investigation, was not available for comment. Um, Assistant Los Angeles Police Chief Daryl Gates, head of the Special Investigation Task Force set up to hunt the slasher, also refused to comment on Greenwood or report that he was a prime suspect. The bodies of six of the slasher current victims have been found in doorways, empty buildings, vacant lots, and shrubbery in the Skid Row area. Each bore the slasher's grisly trademark, a distinctive throat wound, and other evidence of some bizarre ritual at each murder scene led detectives to conclude that all were the work of the same killer. The bodies of three victims, one in the downtown area and two in Hollywood, were found in blood-smeared apartments marked by the same telltale ritualistic evidence. The body of the first victim was found December 1, 1974 on the library patio and eight, uh, and eight more men, many of them derelicts and drifters, several of them homosexuals, died in an almost regular pattern before the ninth victim's body was discovered January 31st in a Hollywood apartment. Police mounted one of the most intense manhunts in Los Angeles history. We ran down hundreds of leads, questioned scores of people, ran surveillance, used dec decoys, and even uh, listened to a half dozen confessions without turning up anything solid, said one LAPD detective. The suspect was described as between 20 and 30 years old, 6 feet tall, and weighing about 190 pounds. A composite sketch drawn from descriptions given by persons who may have seen the slasher, showed a sharp-featured Caucasian with stringy blonde hair. At the time, according to one police source, plans to release a second profile depicting a black suspect. Ah, so they actually had that information. Uh, described by witnesses in two 1964 slasher-style slang, were dropped because there was no evidence the killer was black, and the second profile was considered irrelevant and possibly confusing. Huh. Wow, so they had a suspect in the, in the 264 ones that were similar. They had a black suspect, and they decided not to do that on this one because, I mean, it's pretty weird, right? I mean, I guess they didn't know for sure if it was connected. Although Assistant Chief Gates and other ranking LAPD officers have declined to comment on any of the aspect of the Greenwood investigation, one detective pointed out that no further slasher slings have been reported since the suspect was arrested three days after the last body was found. That doesn't really mean a hell of a lot, but it does make us more suspicious, he said. Greenwood, a black, from, uh, was arrested at his home following the February 2 attack. See, here we go. This was a, there was a survivor. His name was uh, William Graham. And that was February 2nd, just two days later. Um, so it was arrested at his home following the February 2nd attack of William Graham, 36, and Kenneth Ricker, 22, at Graham's Hollywood Hills home above Sunset Boulevard. So it's interesting, though, that this is sort of a divergence from a one victim deal. You know, this is like two people there at the same time. Graham and Ricker told police they were awakened in a bedroom of the fashionable house at about 5.30 a.m. by a man wielding a hatchet and a knife. Both men suffered cuts in struggling with the intruder. A friend of Graham said Saturday that he now is uh, recuperating at home from multiple injuries. After falling through the window with the intruder, Graham ran to a neighboring residence owned by a neighbor, Burt Reynolds, Hope that's not. Does that mean is that really like Burt Reynolds? <laughs> you know, like the Burt Reynolds? <laughs> I mean, how many Burt Reynolds lived in Hollywood? I mean, that's, let's see. Graham ran. It should have said not the. You know, or maybe it was. I, I don't know. After falling through the window with the intruder, Graham ran to a neighboring resident owned by 
No, it is actor. It says right there, by actor Burt Reynolds. Wow. <laughs> That's freaking crazy. I wonder if he actually has a story on that. I mean, I've never heard him mention that or anything. Uh, Graham ran to a neighboring residence owned by actor Burt Reynolds. Reynolds was not at home, but a caretaker called police. Graham was taken to UCLA Medical Center and initially was listed in critical condition. Now, the attacker ran into the foothills and successfully evaded a police officer who fired 10 shots at him. Police arrested Greenwood the following day at his South Central Los Angeles home. Detectives said they made an arrest after receiving a tip from an informant. Greenwood has been held since that time in Central Jail on $50,000 bail. He will be arraigned before BAFA on five counts of burglary and three counts of assault with a deadly weapon. All right, so that, that was when it, you know, he first got arrested. Then on the 19th, suspect linked to Chicago slashings. So I don't know anything about these. A suspect in the Los Angeles Skid Row slasher murders was convicted in Chicago. Oh, yeah, this is before, I think. Was convicted in Chicago of aggravated assault in the ear-to-ear -ear slashing of a man inside of a Skid Row hotel here, police said Tuesday. Uh, Vaughn Oren Greenwood, 31, also was acquitted in the double murder of two men found in Chicago parking lot nearly 10 years ago. One of the victims had his head bashed in. I mean, look how similar this stuff is, a spokesman said, and the other had his throat slashed. Sergeant Rocco Rinaldi of the Shakespeare District Homicide Detail said he uh, he dealt with Greenwood during the two earlier cases and was certain he was the same man being held in Los Angeles. He said Los Angeles investigators came to see him last week to find out how he communicated with Greenwood and to gain information on his Chicago background. Los Angeles police went to Chicago to Philadelphia for further check on Greenwood and additional slasher type cases there. He's a very cunning he's very cunning, Rinaldo, Rinaldi said. He wouldn't tell me anything but his name. Rinaldi said when Greenwood was in Chicago, he was praying on derelicts on West Madison Street. He reminds me of a jackal in the jungle feeding on all those poor people, he said. In nineteen sixty seven Greenwood was sentenced to serve eight to ten years on an aggravated battery charge, he was accused of using a butcher knife to cut the throat of a Mance Porter 60 of Chicago inside a hotel room on West Madison Street. At the trial, Porter said he met Greenwood on the street near his hotel. Oh, look, how, look at this, man. Look at this right here. This is right there. I uh, took him to his room where he demanded money. Uh, when Porter said he, uh, he had none, he said Greenwood slashed him from ear to ear. Wow, that's crazy. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, I cover, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? I mean? This is 1974, so yeah. Yeah, I cover all anything, you know. And most of the cases that you might go, hey, have you covered this one? I've probably already done it. Yeah, I've covered um, way over a thousand cases at this point uh, let's see and sometimes I don't even remember them because it was like a year and a half ago and we've done 600 since then now somebody said hey Grady you cover cases from the 80s <laughs> I mean, are you are you kidding me I mean man uh, let's see Greenwood did his time in Illinois Juliet and Menard State Prison and was released on January 3rd 1973 Wow so uh, just like a year, two years later, six months before the end of his sentence. Sergeant Rinaldi said Greenwood was charged with the murder of Edward Dobley, a veteran with a wooden leg, and John Lewis, both Skid Row residents, whose bodies were found side by side in a parking lot in June of 1965. Rinaldi said a man who confessed to being Greenwood's accomplice was sentenced to two to four years in prison, but Greenwood his case handled by a public defender was acquitted in a jury trial. Los Angeles Police Chief Edward Davis said Sunday Greenwood was a suspect in the Skid Row slasher case. He has not been charged with any of the nine slasher murders, but
but is being held in the hatchet assault on two men in, in, uh, in a burglary. He is scheduled to be arraigned Friday. An order issued by Superior Court Judge Frank Baffa Monday silenced Los Angeles authorities from talking about the killings. So they actually put a gag order on this case right away. I mean, it was it's pretty crazy. Slasher suspect convicted of throat slashing in 67. So uh, a possible suspect in the Los Angeles slasher murders was convicted in Chicago 1967 in connection with a throat slashing and also was acquitted on two murder charges here. So that's almost the same story there. Uh, get to the next one. Superior Court Judge extends slasher suspect silence rules. So this is a picture that I have on the thumbnail there. A Superior Court Judge Friday extended the gag order, silence police and other officials uh, you know, I'd put on the case. The gag order was effective until Greenwood's court appearance Friday. Greenwood was sent back to jail and ordered to return to court May 5th. Greenwood, who served time in Illinois for a knife assault, is alleged to have attacked William Graham, 31, and his house guest, Ken Ricker, 22, during a burglary of Graham's home. Graham was listed in critical condition at UCLA Medical Center after the incident, but both he and Richter have since recovered. The suspect was reportedly injured when he fell through a window and rolled down a hill. At the Friday hearing, Green was uh, was on crutches, but no explanation was given for his injuries. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know where it came from. Well, thanks, Denise Wilson. And this is serial killer, or, you know, they're usually the solved cases. Sometimes we do ones that are ongoing and haven't been solved. Wilson inmate indicate, indicted in L.A. slasher case. Uh, a man already in prison for a hatchet attack was indicted Friday in the Skid Row slasher case. Lon Oren Greenwood, 31, was named in 11 murder counts Returned Friday by... So those are those two from uh, back in 1964. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. They Now they got them. Nine of the... Vi all... Let's see. Nine of the 11 victims were attributed to the Skid Row slasher, a burglar who also preyed on derelict victims' throats were slit from ear to ear. Greenwood, who had been sentenced to 32 years in, to life in prison in connection with a hatchet attack, on two men in Hollywood Hills also was charged with one count of assault in the indictment issued Friday. He is serving the hatchet term at Folsom Prison. Authorities said his arraignment uh, on the indictment charges is expected in about two weeks. Greenwood is charged in the indictment with two 1964 murders at the downtown public library, nine murders attributed to the slasher, in late 1974 and early 1975, and an assault reported in November 1974. The indictment said the last five slasher, uh, yeah, Greenwood is charged in the indictment with two 1964 murders, and that's of, uh, let's see, that is David Russell and Benjamin Hornberg. Greenwood was arrested February 3rd, 1975 in the Hollywood Hills hatchet attack Authorities have reported no attacks with the characteristics of the slasher since then. Yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious. You know, you make the arrest, and then there's no more. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, just send me, uh, hey, uh, YWAC, just send me a, a uh, an email if you want me to cover something, all right? And your name's a little bit strange. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. That's a little little out there. All right. We got that one. All right, I'm going to move on. Now we're... So that was January 24th, 1976, that last one. Now we're in October 1976. Policeman punished for Skid Row slasher leak. 
So what did he say? Another high-ranking Los Angeles police officer has been demoted and second police uh, officials punished in connection with leaking skitter. You know what I should do is I should put myself in jail to finish the show off because I said that the name was crazy. That's right, Gray. You really should. Okay, I'm going to do it. Let's see if it helps out tonight at all because we're, we're really struggling again. As soon as you cover something else, boom. So let's see. Uh, here's the jail cell, everybody. Hey, we can't get out until we finish this, uh, to, for us to finish the story. And then if we have time, we'll do a few minutes of newspapers and call it a day. <sighs> I'm going to throw myself in jail to see if we can get this going here. If not, this is how the show's going to end with no conclusion. Yeah, well, we're like 70% Zozo, so, you know. I'd like to be able to give out a mug, but it's not going to happen. Although, all the names will be transferred over to the next night. Last night, we got saved at the buzzer by Jay Case. Tonight, if we didn't have um, the... Uh, oh, shit, I can't hear. My brain's not working. All right, Paul at Leonard, what is that? Yeah, like without quietly frozen, this would have been like absolutely a 50 percenter. Well, hey, Paulette Leonard and living it. I don't know what that is. Are those just like, hey, stay in jail? <laughs> All right. Hey, there you go. Got Norm Scanlon. We're almost in mug territory, you guys. If you just get going here. Living it, as in living the dream. Paulette Leonard. A dollar short of a a, uh, a wedge. <laughs> rage quit, rage quit, rage quit, rage quit, rage quit. So what is this stuff? Is this bail? It doesn't say bail on any of these. Okay, yours is... Okay, yours is bail. Oh, and there's Chrissy, 1687. Man, we're almost there, you guys. We're almost at the at a uh, at a free cart mug. We're almost there. Something. I think it's uh, eight dollars short. There you go. But thank you, guys. Uh, I'll get out of here now. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Chrissy, sixteen eighty-seven. What's that? What's the deal with sixteen eighty-seven? Is it just that there's um, one thousand six hundred and eighty-six Chrissies before you created your account, or does there is there is that the year your family came over, or you know? <laughs> I don't know what that means. I gotta know what 1687 means. I gotta know. I gots to know, man. I gots to know. Yep. No other PayPal's came in. I wonder if she'll answer that one. <laughs> Come on. We'll continue on after we get the answer. I'm kind of interested in what this leak is right here. January. Huh? What does that mean, Dana? January 6, 6 1987. Huh? Oh, there you go. Joe Montana. Oh, yeah. 16. He was a quarterback, right? 87 was the receiver. Boom. Okay. Yeah, I used to be a fan of Lenny Dawson. He was number 16 for the Kansas City Chiefs. Year of her birth. Yeah, right. Now, we already got the answer. 
That was uh, football players. Anyway, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Getting us close. We can. We'll, we'll do a free cart mug regardless. All right. All right. Another high-ranking Los Angeles police officer has been demoted, and a second police official punished in connection with leaking Skid Row slasher files to a film company. I think there's some crazy stuff that goes on with this guy. Uh, I saw some reference somewhere, and I go, well, I don't want to read about it. I'll see if it comes up later. Police Chief Ed Davis Wednesday said he demoted he was he demoted Lieutenant James Williams, 46, who headed the department's major crime section, and relieved him of duty pending a police trial board hearing. Davis said Williams, a 19-year department veteran, who also reduced in rank from lieutenant to lieutenant one and given a pay cut. <laughs> Map quests, huh? Hey, thank you, Lisa Mosley. Wow, now we're close to the uh, the regular. The we're close to the uh, what do you call it? The everything monk. Okay, we're close to it. Davis said, "Williams, a, a thank you very much, Lisa Mosley." Map quest. I remember that. Map quest was like, I don't know if do people still use that one. I just use Google Maps now. Look at, look at, look at, look at maps. Look at, look at, look at maps. Davis said Williams, a 19-year-old near department veteran, was also reduced in rank from Lieutenant 2 to Lieutenant 1 and given a pay cut. Depending on the outcome of the hearing, he could be suspended or fired. Davis said Williams had, for, person, uh, had for personal gain, improperly disclosed official department information relating to the investigation of Vaughn Greenwood to unauthorized persons outside the department. Greenwood is accused of being the so-called Skid Row Slasher, allegedly responsible for nine ritualistic murders in 1974 and 1975. He is also charged with two murders in 1964. Davis also ordered investigator Ronald Clem, 41, suspended for... 10 days on grounds he failed to report the alleged leaking of information. Well, I mean, it's a thin blue line, right? You're not going to have somebody. Earlier, Davis demoted and suspended Assistant Chief George Beck for allegedly failing to report the release of information to the Ralph Andrews Productions Incorporated. The company was working on a feature film on the murder. Hmm. Uh, meanwhile, a bloody footprint on a magazine found near the body of a slasher victim was made by a shoe worn by the man who faces trial for the series of murders a police expert claims. A prosecution brief released Wednesday showed that the expert also determined that shoe prints at the scenes of five other slasher attacks could have been made by the same type of shoe worn by Greenwood. Hey, thank you, KJO76. Did I? I got Lisa on there, right? All right not a, I didn't give her enough squares. That's what happened. There we go. Hmm, so that's kind of interesting. The shoe thing there. A prosecution brief released Wednesday showed that the expert also determined that the shoe prints at the scene of five other slasher attacks could have been made by the same type of shoe worn by Greenwood. Los Angeles Police Department criminalist James Anderson was more precise about the footprint found at the death scene of Robert Shanahan, a 46-year-old drifter from Texas, whose body was found in a downtown hotel on January 15, 1975. In his opinion, as a duly qualified expert, the prosecution brief said, Anderson determined Greenwood's right shoe and no other made the shoe print at the Shanahan scene. The lone footprint was discovered on a magazine lying between Shanahan's body and the doorway, according to the brief. Shanahan's throat had been slit. 
The documents were made public following a closed-door court session during which Superior Judge Earl Brody, Brody denied a defense motion to exclude Anderson's testimony at the upcoming trial of Greenwood. Uh, Deputy Public Defender Charles Gessler, Greenwood's attorney, had argued that the pro probative value of the expert testimony of the shoe prints would be outweighed by its prejudicial effect. Jury selection, initially scheduled to begin last Monday for the trial, has been delayed by pretrial motions and is now expected to uh, expected to the start to start early next week. Among the other footprints mentioned in the prosecution brief were three found near where Arnold Bowie, a 50-year-old transient, was beaten on the lawn of the downtown public library in November. So this is a person that was beaten just prior, and it's another one of the victims, but he lived. Uh, Bowie survived that attack, however, and is scheduled to testify at Greenwood's trial. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so now, now I think this is where we, we get some crazy shit in here, I think. So anyways, a man who survived an attack by Von Greenwood, who had a knife in each hand, testified Tuesday about the assault for which the accused slasher spent only 10 days in jail. Greenwood's release from jail came just about a month before the start of the 1974. Oh, so that was the November attack. And he only served 10 days and he got out and then he killed uh, nine people. What a, see, that's what's so ridiculous. God, man. Greenwood is on trial charged with those nine murders that terrorized the Skid Row and Hollywood areas and two other downtown killings in 1964. Yeah. Huh. What do you mean? What, what software? What software are you talking about? And by the way, when you said fifty dollars in two minutes, uh, come here on donation night. <laughs> that, that's nothing. All right. uh, that's where we're going to probably. I'm going to try to get to over uh, right around forty-five hundred dollars for this month. But what do you what uh, software for what? Well, I'm using Google Earth, if that's what you're asking. I'm not using 3D Studio Max for this. If you're talking about the software for the the time, then yes, that was the $1,500 3D Studio Max. Uh, you you kind of ask some strange questions. You're, you're right on the verge of trollness. All right, so well, well, I'm going to keep an eye on that shit. Okay, Greenwood released from jail came just about a month before the start of 1974-75 series of slasher slings. Greenwood is on trial, charged with those nine murders that terrorized the Skid Row and Hollywood areas, and two other downtown killings in 1964. Uh, it was on a plea bargain approved by the city attorney's office that Greenwood was allowed to plead guilty October 23, 1974 to committing a misdemeanor assault on Joseph Arnold Nolan. When uh, Deputy District Attorney Marsh Goldstein called Nolan a witness Tuesday, Superior Court Judge Earl C. Brody explained. So now we get to hear how this went down. Nolan, a security guard. Uh, let's see the jury that the uh, purpose of his testimony was to show a similarity in the unique mythology methodology okay so of the slasher okay Nolan a security guard born in the Virgin Islands told the jurors in a let's see something like lilting accent about the attack in his one bedroom apartment let's see where that was so this is right before the murders. This is at 744 South 
Beacon Street. Oh yeah, see this is right in there. This is right in that area, so. I had a feeling it was going to be closer because it was right before. So this is the individual named uh, What's his name? I'll just say uh, security guard. Let's see, this is November, so 19, 1974, November, right there. All right, there we go. Greenwood is on a trial charged with those nine murders that terrorized the Skid Row and Hollywood areas. Okay, so we already got that. So now we're over here where, um, you know, we're, we're finding out where this person lived. He lives right in that area. So you can definitely see. I mean, look at that. Look how close it is to Robert Shanahan right there. And then he starts moving into this area. I mean, and then the last two are way over here which was, that's what threw them off a little bit. All right, uh, so then it said, okay, so one bedroom apartment at 744 South Beacon Street in the early morning hours of October 19th, 1974. I was awakened by blows I could not describe. There were coming, uh, where they were coming from, even thought it was a dream, but it was reality, he testified. Nolan said he awakened to see a man with a knife in each hand standing on the left side of his bed. He explained that he later learned that they were only one uh, that that it were only one kitchen knives. They were no, no, excuse me. They were my own kitchen knives. So the guy broke in, took the victim's kitchen knives. He said he asked the intruder what he was doing there, and the man replied that he was in the wrong apartment. Finding blood running down his face and neck, Nolan said he threatened to call the police and ordered the man out of the apartment. The man jumped on me and I tried to wrestle him and he struck me here, Nolan said, pointing to his side. He cut me on the throat. He stabbed me. Prosecutor Goldstein had the six foot two, 200 pound Nolan stand before the seven-man, five-women jury to display the scars on his neck. They were located high in the throat, similar in location to the fatal wounds inflicted on the slasher victims. Let's see, I've never heard of this here, even though I lived in the West Coast at the time. All right. Nolan said he was able to break away from Greenwood and ran out of the apartment. Well, I'm, I'm glad you like it, uh, YWAC. <laughs> Might want to change the name, though. I don't like saying your name, so, you know. I hope that doesn't affect you, but it just sounds kind of like intentionally shitty. You know, like somebody named... Uh, you know, Jack, and then... <laughs> but, yeah. No one said he was able to break away from Greenwood and ran out of the apartment. He said he later observed Green, Greenwood leave and follow him. Nolan told the jurors he flagged down a passing police car and the officers captured Greenwood. All right, then that, that was November, and then... Skid Row Slasher, guilty of nine killings, mistrial on two of them. So probably the 1964, I would imagine. Uh, Von Oren Greenwood faces possible life imprisonment when he's sentenced January 19 for eight of the Skid Row Slasher murders that terrorized Los Angeles transients two years ago. After six days of deliberation, a Los Angeles Superior Court jury Wednesday found the 33-year-old drifter guilty of nine counts of murder. Originally, prosecutors had 
um, indicated they wanted the death penalty, but California's capital punishment law was declared unconstitutional while the trial was underway. Oh, that's interesting. Greenwood was convicted of eight of the nine killings attributed to the slasher. <coughs> he was also convicted of a 1964 murder, uh, so I guess he hit one of those, and one count of assault with intent to commit murder. The jury failed to reach a verdict on two other murder counts, and Superior Court Clerk Steve Brown said a mistrial would be declared in those cases. Greenwood was in, indicted for 11 murders, including two in 1964, and the nine slasher killings between December 1st, uh, 1974 and January 31st, 1975. All victims had their throat slashed from ear to ear down to the spine. Investigators said they found evidence that, they, listen to this, that the killer drank the blood of at least two victims and that he removed their shoes and placed them in a pattern around the body. Salt was sprinkled around the bodies, forming a gruesome mosaic, authorities said. I mean, this is an absolute serial killer right here. Had no other motive at all other than to... I mean, look at those uh, signatures all over the place. This guy... Man. And it almost feels like he, he was sort of upgrading. You know, he was like starting off really low and he kept like it was making him more powerful it almost seems like right like after drinking the blood at least two victims that he removed their shoes and placed them in a pattern around the body salt was sprinkled around the bodies uh let me see oh, what is that Huh, it's weird because salt is used in like spells and rituals and shit like that. But uh, it says black salt, so I don't know. The spiritual uses for salt are just about as white. It's like there's a ton of different things, so forget it. Uh, most of the deaths centered uh, in the downtown Skid Row area with transients, the victims. The last two murders occurred in Hollywood. Greenwood is already serving 32 years to life sentence stemming from a robbery at the home of actor Burt Reynolds. I thought it was across the street from there. And a hatchet attack on two men in a house in the Hollywood Hills. He has been in custody since he was arrested February 3rd, 1975. Isn't that weird? He was arrested four days after the last murder. Three days. And... Uh, it wasn't even four of those. It was just something else. Prosecutors based their case on similarities among the killings and the testimony of a witness who said he saw Greenwood outside a hotel room where a slasher victim was found. Deputy public defender Charles Gessler claimed the evidence in most of the cases was circumstantial. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like they have the right guy here, but you just never know. Greenwood gets nine life terms. So, Superior Judge Earl Brody said today he hoped Vaughn Greenwood would never again be released into society as he sentenced the convicted slasher slayer to nine life terms. However, the judge said the law required that the multiple sentences run concurrently. So that means they're all the same, the first, you know, together. Like it's not. Um, consecutively like you do 10 years then another 10 years and then another 10 years they're all it's almost like just having one you know that's stupid i did not have the power to sentence him to life without the possibility of parole brody said in imposing the sentences for nine slayings that span decades the sentences imposed today also will merge and run simultaneously there you go within a 30 year to life term meted out in mid-1975 for a series of crimes that included the burglary of actor... So now it is the back, the actor Burt Reynolds' home. And a hatchet attack on two... Oh, a burglary at that house. That's right. And then he did the... Oh, wow. So he did try... He broke into Burt Reynolds' home and, and burglarized it, but then had a hatchet attack at a neighbor's house. <laughs> Jesus. 
To increase the minimum time Greenwood must serve, Brody sentenced the 33-year-old man under the habitual criminal statute, noting that he has been involved in criminal activity not only all of his adult years, but for many years while he was still a juvenile. This statute calls for 15 years to be served before parole is considered, but Department District Attorney Marshall Goldstein, the chief prosecutor in the case, said there are certain provisions that could cut that minimum time to 10. I mean, look at how, why do we, like, cater to the these barbarians and give them, like, these breaks all the time? It's just ridiculous. Asked if he agreed with Brody's statement that Greenwood should never be released, the prosecutor replied, absolutely. How can you let someone as dangerous as Mr. Greenwood back on the streets? Department Public Defender Charles Gessler, Greenwood's attorney, responded differently, saying, who can say what he will be like in just shut the hell up in 10 to 20 years? I don't think anyone can predict that now. I have to tell you what, though. Uh, public defender Charles Gessler, I tell you what. I Let's let him out in 15, but he gets to stay at your house for the first year. I mean, <laughs> did I say what I just said? Uh, yeah, what I meant to say was, of course he would. Five of the jurors who convicted Greenwood sat in the back row of the courtroom for sentencing. They had found him guilty three weeks ago on eight of the nine slasher slangs that terrorized the downtown Skid Row and Hollywood areas in the, in the winter of 1974-75 and one of the two murders he was charged with committing in 1964. Eight of the victims died from throat slashings that ran from ear to ear in what Roddy... Brody called the trademark of the killer. Yeah, so that's it, man. <laughs> let me go to the. I thought that was pretty freaking interesting. Oh yeah, there is something else though. Let me let me let's just. And by the way, look at Wikipedia on this. Nothing. I mean that that story deserves a hell of a lot more. You know, like it should be famous and have, this should be like one of those Wikipedias that's long, right? Um, he died. Wow, he just died uh, December eighteenth, twenty twenty. So he he lived a long damn time. I almost want to let's look him up somehow. Is, did he did he ever make it out of there? Okay. Now oh, that's a better picture right there. This is on Reddit here. Hmm. Ah, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh. that in there Vaughn what was his middle name again that wasn't no it was er or Orin Yeah, he's not in there. I'd like to know if he ever got out. That's what I want to know. Yeah, well, I hope you guys liked that one. It, you know what was crazy about that one? Is it came from a newspapers.com. We just sort of stumbled upon it. I was like, oh, wow, look at this. Um, I don't remember why, like what what was the word we looked up, but it was was about a couple weeks ago. Let me try a different a, a date range here. How about like 1990 to 2000 or something? <clears throat> so 
Is that the same one? Yeah, so he was put in Wikipedia in 2011. So he's on Murderpedia 2002 here. Uh, so, you know, there's some art, some stuff out there. I mean, we just did it. We just went through way more than you're going to see here. We went through each death and, you know, mapped out where it all was. And victim profile, down and out, alcoholic bums. Well, not really. There's a couple other, you know, went outside of that. Ritualistic abuse, cups of blood next to bodies. Oh, boy, look at that. That's interesting. I'd like to see where that came from. You know, let's try Let me look at something here. If you go to this other source, we could go to Vaughn Greenwood. And let's go 1975. California. Oh, so he made it into here. I think. And I wonder if this has more. Uh, this is like May. Yeah, this is a different source here. Court issues gag order. Yeah. Let me try like a random outside of that where somebody's doing a, like a synopsis of it. 1978 to 1988 or something. Yeah, he's, he's in the paper there. Good slasher, Vaughn Greenwood. Yeah. How about right here, 1978. You know what I should do is type in his name, cup, and blood or something. Skid Row Killer. Oh, yeah. So here's the thing. So in 1978, there was these other articles that kept having... Greenwood's name in it. So I was like, well, what's going on there? And then look at this. The Skid Row Stabber, it's a different different one, is an American serial killer responsible for the murders of 11, another 11 people. What are the odds of that? In Los Angeles neighborhood known as Skid Row, another Skid Row killer with 11 deaths, which is notorious for housing huge numbers of homeless people who are regularly subjected to victimization. So this started, but these murders were from 78 to 79 and then there was a suspect that was convicted uh, but then that suspect was exonerated in 2017 but never knew as he suffered a heart attack and was in a coma until his death in 2019 oh that sucks Jeez. yeah so you know that's this is a whole nether in the exact same spot just literally four years later, 11 more uh, Skid Row murders, and there was a man convicted of it, but he didn't actually, it turns out he didn't do it. I mean, that's crazy, right? So I don't know if we want to check that one out one day or not. I don't know. I'm kind of all um, Skid Row slashed out. <laughs> uh So there you go, everybody. Well, I hope you guys uh, thought that was, you know, found it interesting. And thank you for getting us caught up on a, you know, a regular night. You know, it's only a couple bucks short of the normal thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the, uh, we're going to do the anything, everything mug regardless. Okay. There we go. Let me check if somebody else sent something in. One last check. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, are you just sending me that link for just for a source, a resource, or something? All right. Thanks, Dennis. Oh, and then, oh well, thank you to uh, a Cash App from uh, Ramesia. <laughs> Oh, I'll put I'll put this in anyways. I don't have to. Yeah, it's hard to read these things, but thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna put this in the the wheel of names. Okay. The wheel of names. And here we go. And by the way, while we're still doing the show, make sure you guys get over there to I should have said this during our those busy nights, but you get so busy you're not seeing it. But check out GHI the Missing Network on Facebook where Zozo and a whole bunch of other people are, you know, they keep it going. Sarita, you know, Lee D. It's the Aussie, the Aussie missing people. All right. <laughs> well, it's not. I mean, it's not Aussie missing people. They're they're the ones that run it, but it's every any missing person. All right. So it's GHI the missing, uh, the missing network. It's not missing though. It's there. Okay. Uh, and then also check out Discord. That's one. Of, that's something Beholder set up. And I think, uh, I don't know, maybe I should do another post in uh, the community section at some point with the, another link. Or is that one permanent? But there's a link in the community section somewhere in on YouTube that you can scroll down and find it. So there you go. All right. Yeah. The channel members section. What's that one? Yeah, it's for channel members only, though. Yeah. All right, you guys. There it is. Let's do the uh, shuffle here. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, they, it looks like they updated it a little bit. A little, little different look. A little, a little better, it looks like. Are right, you guys? You guys ready? This is for the everything mug. And five, four, three. Two, one. <laughs> Look at that. Delva Johnson again. I mean, how many times is Delva Johnson going to win this? Does, doesn't it seem like Delva Johnson wins once a week? And here's the thing. Like, I think she sent in, might have been 10 bucks or something. I so she wins. That's that's just called luck. I mean, it's amazing. Delva Johnson, are you still here, Delva Johnson? Do you want the everything mug or? <laughs> I, I give people a chance if they want to like re you know submit it or not. Delva Johnson. I know. Seriously, like. Everyone can just pull some money in and then let Delva Johnson, um, like, oh, spin again. There we go. There we go. Well, that's very nice of you, Delva Johnson. Look at that. Delva Johnson paying it forward to all the other freaks. All right. Here we go. So I'm spinning again and let me shuffle. But man, you should go play the lottery tomorrow, Delva. I mean, my God, you're like. Lisa Mosley. All right. There you go. Lisa Mosley, you still out there? You won. You won the uh, everything mug. And then you just send me a uh, email with your address. And uh, then I'll ship it right off. But it's up to you guys to to see that you won or not, and then send me an email with your addresses. 
All right, and if you don't hear from me after you send me your address and showing you a receipt like within two days, email me again because there's some days where you get like 60 emails and they all just got all over the place and, you know, it's hard, but I try to do it right away. Like the second I see them, I send them off. Does anybody want to see who would have won? <laughs> Next. <laughs> huh? Anybody want to see who would have won? There we go. We're going to do one. This is this is the heartbreak, man. This is who would have won. All right. Here, here it is. Here's who would have won. It's going to be two cents, right? Oh, look at that. It would have been Nick. It would have been Nikki. Ah, darn it. Man, that's too bad. All right. It just shows, though, you have the possibility. <laughs> you have the absolute possibility of winning at some point. I think you've won before, though, haven't you? <laughs> Murphy's Law. Yeah, there you go. Wow, is that? Look at look at Chloe over there. She doesn't even look real at this point. I mean, she looks like she's just one of the toys sitting. Look at. Look at that. That, that. That's actually a dog over there. It, like it just sort of... Chloe! <laughs> yep, yep, there you go. Yep. <laughs> what a bum. Jeez. What a... <laughs> What's a female bum called? A bum-ass? A bum -at? There aren't really a lot of them, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you guys very much for being here, supporting the channel. Uh, you know, some nights are slower than others, but uh, thank you guys for make, uh, recovering for the night there. It's pretty good. And, uh, yes, we will see you guys tomorrow. All right. So, um, yeah. It should, uh, I don't know what we're going to be talking about. I have a feeling there's going to be some updates in Naomi Irion's case, but uh, it, it just doesn't doesn't it feel like that? Like they might have a press conference to give us inf more information. I don't know. That's just what I was thinking. But anyways, we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> right. Well, either, uh, apparently, two cents. Neither does the Supreme Court uh, judge that we're nominating. She doesn't know what it means. All right, guys. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys tomorrow. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. In a two, in a three, in a four. In a... Hey, Gray, well, what's going on, man? For quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person. Uh, not much, that Mary Lou. I was just kind of going to let the music play. Can you do the same? I'm a no, I can't. Human lie detector. Gonna I'm gonna get ya. ya. I'm a stretcher. If you grab any, any like, like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. If I felt like we was gonna give another lecture. Crime conductor, free connector. And I'm always gonna be a part of the tank. Hold on, like a interceptor. And I'm even gonna spend a little bit. Remember, I've a temple fucking check ya. I have no agenda. I'm not a tender. And I'll say I'll tell you straight what I've got under. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Crime sector is my name. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. Alright, everybody. Back here. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. Alright, everybody. Back here. Oh, wait a minute. I gotta come back on. I forgot to thank everybody again. Because <laughs> it didn't show up on the screen. Hold on. I gotta, I'm gonna reset uh, this thing. Hold on. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> hey, it's bonus uh, material, right? Bonus material. All right, so thank you to uh, Quietly Frozen, Cat Eye Donation, Billy Juliana, uh, Kelly Dragonborn, Diana B. Northwest Girl, Debbie Barnes, D&K Rec, uh, Mary Hayes, 
Kathy Frydenmaker, Marilyn Riley, Candle Lee Woodward Stone, Linda Howell, as in Linda Molden Howe of the Cattle Mutilations and Crop Circles, Zozo, Amber Maiden, Plato, Quietly Frozen, Shogun Love, Cheyenne R., Tina Susser, Nikki124, Anthony Galvez, Freebird Forever, uh, Sandra Turner with a, uh, let's see, yeah, it was Freebird Forever, Sandra Turner, Blind Squirrel, Pebs W, Paulette Leonard, Living It, Norm Scanlon, Chrissy1687, and Lisa Mosley with a cat eye, and KJO76. Then we've also got uh, uh, Delva Johnson and uh, Linda Molden Howe on PayPal. And then we also had the, uh, well, I got to go get the name now because it, you changed it. Uh, Paint It Black. Okay. Paint It Black. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you very much. And that was a cat eye too from Paint It Black. All right, uh, let me see, let me get out of here. On that one, that one, that one. So do I go do the rap again or how's that work? <laughs> one more time! Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector. Like rejecta, I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector. Fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a spectre with a vector on his pector. With all respect, ya. Just remember, I have a temple for conjecture. I have no agenda. I'm no agenda. agenda. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send you on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody. Talk to you. But I don't need it I chew it up and spit it out and repeat it It's not a treat The troll is beat Just one of the ways that I defeat it Staying in my groove When there's a troll on the move Just takes a second to remove Cause every time you conclude The troll is gonna lose Nice try, lizard eye I see you creeping on the sly Why you think it's a fly? Such a whiny cry, cry That on me, you're gonna fry Gonna send you out to mummify It's time to say goodbye When I'm in the mood, I sprinkle troll on my food, but I don't eat it. I chew it up and spit it out and repeat it. It's not a treat. The troll is beat. Just one of the ways that I defeat it. Stay in my groove. When there's a troll on the move, just take a second to remove. Cause every time you conclude, the troll is gonna lose. Trying, lizard eye. I see you creeping on the sly. Were you trying to sound like me? Yes, I was trying to sound like you. Oh, well, that's kind of nice. Thank you. True about some we did, I was supposed to do. You might not have heard it, or maybe you have, but when I first heard it, all of it was flat. Used to get angry and all up tight, but didn't say what I want to spell my name right. So I'm not guilty of us rocking a house. But I don't know the room of la la bow. Hit me up to then tell all your friends, and if they don't wait till you see me again, this way I can hear it from the horse's mouth. Right then and there, we can straighten it out. <laughs> Da 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 da
bases, chicken meat, let me bases, you keep me in stasis, tighten up those laces. Hey, was that something new you're working on there, Mary Lou? Yeah, I was working on this one. On a nightly basis, you keep me in stasis, tighten up those laces. You never thought. Hey, that might be a pretty good one. You gotta keep working on that one. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for the encouragement. Wow, man. Number eight in the sand. I sit back with this brand new invention. Something that are holding me tightly. Flows like a harpoon daily and nightly. Will it ever stop, y'all? I don't know. Turn off the lights and I'll blow. To the extreme, I'm like the mic like a vandal. Light up the stage and wreck the chump like a candle. Dance, cause it's big as a bone. Killing your brain like a poisonous mushroom. Deadly. When I play a little melody, anything hurts in the best of the family. Love it, believe it. Better game way, you better hit bulls I like hit don't fight. If there was a problem, you will all solve it. Check out the hook, my deep it revolves it. Now that the party is jumping, with the bass kicked in, and the beggars are pumping, quick to the point, to the point, no faking, with the MCs like a pound of bacon, burning them, get quick and nimble, go crazy when they hear the symbol with a high hat. Put a suit up, tempo, I'm on a roll, time to go solo rolling In my 5.0 with my rack top down so my hair can blow The girl is on standby, ready to just say hi Did she stop? No, just scrolls down, get on Close to one to the next stop I'm about to left, I'm headed to the next block Black was head, y'all, so I got turned into a one night Detroit Avenue, girls wear hot man That's the bikinis, rock man, love us, rum and lamborghinis, jealous Cause I'm out getting mine, shaved with a gauge and medulla with a nine Gunshot, hangs out with a bell I got nine on the herb of shells Falling on the concrete real fast Up in my car, swim by the gas Bubble to bubble, the avenue's packed Time to get away from a jack of jack Fish on the scene, you know what I mean Pass me up, perform all the dope beans Set up with a problem, yo, I'll solve it Check out the hook with my DJ without it Alright everybody, thank you, thank you very much, thank you, thank you everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. Would you shut the, oh god. Gosh Gray, I was just saying thank you to all the people that were saying I was really good. Well I'm looking in the chat and I don't see a damn soul, I don't see a soul saying that you did well there. I did though Gray, didn't anybody like me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! What in the hell happened to your voice? I don't know, Gray. I think I had some uh, liquor and some smokes in there. Oh my god. That's, that's ridiculous. Alright, you guys. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, yeah, it was good times. Uh, Mary Lou, a little bit over, overly dramatic there. Uh, wow. Uh, see you guys tomorrow, and as always, be safe out there. Be safe out there. Sheesh, what a maroon. Who says that anymore? Maroon, you what a maroon. I don't know, I saw it on a cartoon once. Oh, was it like uh, uh, Bugs Bunny, something like that? Yeah, yeah, that was Bugs Bunny, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's what I figured. All right, yeah, we'll see you guys tomorrow, and again, be safe out there. Be safe out there, everybody. Is that you, John Boy? Yes, it was, Gray. I just wanted to say something. I don't get to say anything anymore. Yeah, well, there's a good reason for that. All right. See you later. Bye-bye.